Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Perspective Philosophy. Today we're going to have a QA, and a philosophy Q&A. We're also going to have some call-ins. We're going to have some uh, video reviews. We're just going to have a good time. That's the plan. So yeah. Yes, indeed. Latte. Okay. I hope you're all having a lovely night. Nice to see you, M, XB, Aracoda. Nice to see you back. I'll uh, make sure everyone knows that we are now live and uh, good to go. It is a late one today, starting late. I'll be uh, I'll be in a debate tomorrow um, on whether we should have struck the Houthis, and I think we should have. Um, yeah. Um, anything upon uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics, Dengism. Um, I, I mean, like, Dengism, I think, is, uh, like, clever economics. I think that was clever economics more than anything. Um, and, and I think was the real uh, driving force behind Chinese development, not Mao. But I think, in general, when you say socialism with Chinese characteristics, I, I think you really mean like, communism with Chinese characteristics. I think it's uh, essentially a materialist metaphysic, which is terrible, um, unfounded, mixed with... Chinese uh, superstition, usually. So, so yeah, I think it's overall terrible um, rather than actually being metaphysically grounded. I think the additions of Mao uh, make it make the Marxist-Leninist position even worse, where it brings an end to the dialectic through um, a sustained contradiction. Um, and the, that being perpetuated by Deng just led to economic development by essentially... Uh, using Western uh, economic policy without actually committing ideo ideologically to the foundations of the system. So it's capitalism without liberal ethics. So it's ultimately the worst of all worlds. Uh, <laughs> like, really, it's, it's terrible. It's truly terrifying. Um, so, yeah. Uh, hello, Rem. Rem Akil. Maximo, Ma what's up, man? Nice to see you here. Looks like illegal immigration with the reason for the Second Civil War. Um, for whatever, man. I'm, at, at this point, like the the American civil, if the American Civil War is like this, is just political pandering, and this has more to do with the uh, the state of the Republican Party as it is. It's using it using its political motivations to try and impede. Um, <clears throat> try and show up the democrats they're not backing down so in reality it's two-party politics unfolding in a way that is uh becoming increasingly divisive um but it's this the state of the republicans is just awful it's really is um um i agree that's pretty bad but i'm surprised that the ccp actually teaches marxism within schools i don't see why they do that as it indicates ideological commitment because of the way that they engage and they, they they see themselves as like essentially having progressed Marxism to its ideological ends, right? Uh, and that it goes for and that it and that it, it it varies from civilization to civilization, and this is the this is the Marxism for the Chinese and all that. So I don't know what necessarily the content is, as you've just sort of said there, um, but I'm willing to bet that it's state propaganda. <laughs> Hi, our Lord Pastor. Nice to see you. How's everyone doing tonight? You're doing good? Put on some some nice soothing music so it's a little bit a little bit more of an uh a nicer viewing experience, man. Do you like the music like I played last time?
Jaws. Use one Jaws. Use one light Jaws or something. Put some smooth Jaws on. Some sort of coffee coffee shop Jaws. Review the phaser video I said you, sent you. Uh, where is it? Is it in the Discord? I'm assuming it is. Just now you've sent it. Natural law and sexual ethics. Oh, great. An hour and 50 minutes, man. Seems like the people want it. So, who am I to argue? I had, I was, um, I was planning on having a, at, at some point, even talking about, um, natural law, not natural law, um, Ir the Irenaean theodicy, and how I think that very much relates to the idea of being as becoming, um, and the truth of our being is to become, and it's in relation to the, but it al already predates and presumes the complete truth of being, so there is the, the truth of being is become, is found in becoming, but the truth of becoming is only found in being, right? Call in later about Prime Matter. Yeah, man, you're welcome to. Okay. So this is... Ed Faser, Natural Law and Sexual Ethics, right? So we'll... I'm gonna sneeze. <laughs> Even in shadow, <laughs> Prime Matter, how about Optimus Prime? Doesn't he get any love? Thank you very much. And okay, let's let's go. Well, welcome uh, everybody. Good of you to come out on a Saturday afternoon, especially a beautiful Saturday afternoon uh, like this. But I know why you've come out. You've come out. To hear a uh, terrific uh, speaker. Ooh, that noise gate, that 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 gate on that needs too harsh. It's just, I know why they've put it on, but bloody hell. Uh, Edward Fieser is a good man, as well as a brilliant one. Uh, he lives with his wife and six kids out in six uh, kids, bloody Los hell. Angeles. That's in California. You know that can't be easy, right? Explaining why you got six kids all the time. Can you imagine? Uh, Professor uh, Beezer teaches at Pasadena uh, City College. He's been a visiting uh, assistant professor at uh, Loyola Marymount University in the philosophy department there, and he's been a visiting scholar at the famous 
uh, Social Philosophy and Policy Center at Bowling Green uh, University in Ohio. He earned his PhD at the University of California at Santa Barbara uh, with a thesis on uh, Russell and Hayek and the mind-body uh, problem. I just learned that in preparing this introduction. Now I'm going to try to figure out how to get hold of that thesis. Uh, of course, Professor Fieser is well known for his excellent uh, work uh, on Aquinas and Aristotle and on the broad tradition of natural law uh, theorizing, of which he's become a leading exponent. Uh, he's also well known, justly well known, uh, for his puncturing of the pretensions of so many of the uh, new atheists, including my dear old friend from New College, Oxford, with whom I have drunk many coffees and eaten many lunches. Uh, you know that guy, Richard Dawkins. Uh, I will say, you... like, um, I'm happy to watch this video. The only thing I'm get it's the audio, man. Is there a one that has better audio? Does the audio improve? Do you know? Because it's kind of it's it's clipping so much. Like it's clipping so it's like so like um, in and out, man. Noise gate's just far too harsh. Like the like the. Was it the the um like like it, it's just it's just too harshly gated, man. And it's not that I don't think that sex is for reproduction. Obviously, I do. I just think that sex is not only for reproduction. You're not lying to me, are you? You're not just saying that. Haven't read, uh, Professor. Uh... Fieser's book, Superstition. I'm going to see if I'm going to skip past this guy. I'm going to see when Faser comes out. I'm going to see if it improves. Faser is very, very, like, for anyone who missed the introduction there, like, Faser is a genius. He's wrote many books. Very smart man. Catholic philosopher, specifically a Thomist. Uh, most famously known for his argument on the five proofs for the existence of God, which he explicated from the Thomistic position. Okay, and I think he wrote something like uh, The Atheist Delusion. Something along those lines. Uh, humbling, generous introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, I wish I'd really, you know, actually not bothered to write up a talk. It's uh, to live up. To... Okay, I'm joking. But uh, uh, very kind words. I appreciate that. And I uh, appreciate the invitation. It's really bad audio, man. Do you know if there's another one of this? I hate to do it, but like, it's just, this is also a stream that people have to watch, not just something I'm watching on my own personal time. Do you know what I mean? And I just don't know if I can do that to you. Do you know what I mean? Just like an hour and 50 minutes of... Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it, it annoys me. And I'm, and I'm just like a lowly streamer here. Any audio files will be having a seizure right now. You didn't even notice. Can you, do, do I do, do, does anyone else pick up on the bad audio? Is it just me? Is it just? <clears throat> Seems fine to you. Oh, maybe it's my headphones. Like I've got, I've got like studio headphones in so I can have everything. Um, like on sort of. Un unimpeded. I picked up on it. It's real. Okay, good. Yeah, nah, it's gated hard. Thanks very much. I was just making sure I was... Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> issue from the hands comes to sight as well to speak. Well, thank you very much. Um, the title of my talk is Natural Law and the Foundations of uh, Sexual Ethics. And as the first half of the talk indicates, the first half of the title, Natural Law, indicates what I have to say will be controversial, no doubt. The second half of the title, the fact that it's on sexual morality, though, indicates that at least it won't be boring, uh, I hope. And um, as an old professor I used to know, like to say, if you can't instruct them, at least entertain them. Um, so uh, as Professor George noted in the last superstition, I try to do, try to do both, and hopefully I'll be able to do that uh, tonight. Uh, there should be a handout uh, given out. I trust everybody's got one. And um, if you don't have one, I'm sure they'll pass it to you. As you can see from the handout, my talk comes in two basic parts. The first part, which I've labeled the uh, teleology of sex here on the handout, is about the general um, natural law account, traditional natural law account of the, uh, of the purposes of sex. 
And then the second half of the talk is on something known as the perverted faculty argument, a, uh, a famous, some would say infamous or notorious, element of traditional natural law argumentation where sex, sexual morality is concerned. Though I think that it's only properly understood in light of what I have to say in the first half of the talk on um, more natural law and the natural law approach to sex more generally. So we'll get to that, but after we lay some groundwork in the first half of the talk. Um, and I will be reading a paper here, forgive me. I hope, hopefully that will not be too boring for people, but... Uh, was the video feed all right? It was probably my side, because I was just, I was basically sorting it out. I just realized that me, like, donation link wasn't even in the... Um, in the description or anything and i've got the i've got the tip goal there and I'm, i haven't even got the donation like um yeah the reason actually the reason the video link glows black is because i can't because i don't have two monitors and if i had two monitors it wouldn't go black so that's that's actually the truth of it like i don't like if i had a second monitor it would be constantly playing and i wouldn't have to and like i wouldn't be tabbing uh, but because like anytime I tab or like change, they like, try to do anything. Um, sometimes it just does it anyway when I'm on games. Like, so if I try and tab into the game, it'll cut the video feed if I try to, and it's just the, like, so that's the, that's the reason it goes black. That's why I'm basically funding for a second monitor. It's for, it's for everyone. It's for the good of all. Yeah. It's just, um. But yeah, like I'm hoping like and that way I'll be able to see stream when I'm um when I'm playing games as well. So I can have the stream up. I can have so I'll have the stream on one side. So if I want to check out the stream and the chat and everything that I need on this side, um, or the game or whatever, I can be on this side, and then like the whatever I'm sharing or like the game or whatever I'm sharing on that side, right? Hi PP, did you hear about Hassan adding a fake version of him? that he uses in reaction so that there's like 20 minutes of him leaving to go to the restroom and eat. Does he act, has he actually done that? You made really good uh, vegan tacos. That's really good, man. Uh, I was at a conference recently. I noticed that the grad students who were presenting papers were all reading from tablets. And uh, it occurs to me, you can tell the difference between a grad student and a professor. When a grad student reads a paper, he reads it from a tablet. And when a uh, professor reads a paper, he reads it from paper. So I'll be uh, going old school tonight. Probably the next generation, that'll start to change. But I'll be reading from a paper here. So traditional natural law theory grounds morality in general and sexual morality in particular in human nature. The basic idea is that what is good for a thing is determined by the ends or purposes for the sake of which its natural faculties exist. For instance, the roots of a tree exist for the sake of providing the tree with nutrients. But I don't understand how he manages to do that. Like, how did he manage to just do that in the feet? Like, how would it be identical to him, right? Like, such that it's just constantly reacting. And, and how is it in the same clothes and stuff? Does he wear the same thing on stream all the time? I don't understand. And stability. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I'm really struggling with this because the noise gate is really throwing us off. Like, I don't know if anyone feels the same. Uh, is it like, I think I'm, I, I really do think I'm going to have to swap it over. I'll watch it in my own time. And I, I might even see if I do response to this, if I can clear the, clean the audio up um, myself, I might be able to do something about it. Maybe. It's just, it's, it's awful. Like, I'm sorry. Like it, the audio is fine for me. Oh man. Oh God. Uh, all right. Well, I'll just soldier through if you guys. But to the extent that a tree grows strong and deep roots, it realizes these ends and thereby flourishes. And to the extent that it fails to realize these ends, it is defective and, and tends to atrophy. A squirrel by nature needs to hoard nuts for the winter. If it works to realize this end, it will to that extent count as a good instance of a squirrel. Whereas a squirrel, which for whatever reason, brain, brain injuries say, or a genetic defect, had no inclination to do so, would, uh, to that extent, be a bad and defective instance. Note that there's no naturalistic fallacy or illicit is-ought inference in noting these biological facts, and neither is there such a fallacy in determining uh, what is good for human beings by reference to their nature. Human beings are no different from other living things in having characteristic faculties that exist for the sake of pursuing certain ends. Now, all sorts of questions might be raised about the implications of this view, and about its philosophical foundations, which lie in Aristotelian metaphysics. 
I've addressed these questions in several uh, writings, and most thoroughly in a forthcoming essay from which this talk is extracted. Here I will simply provide a brief sketch of the approach to um, the traditional or old natural law theory, as opposed to the new natural law theory of Germaine Grise, John Finnis, and Professor George, uh, takes towards issues of sexual morality. Now, when we apply traditional natural law theory to sexuality, the first step is to identify the natural end or ends of our sexual faculties. For if what is good for us is determined by what realizes the ends inherent in our nature, then what is good for us in the sexual context can only be what realizes the ends of our sexual faculties. For Aquinas and other natural law theorists who build on an Aristotelian metaphysical foundation, to be a human being is to be a rational animal. That we are animals of a sort entails that the vegetative, sensory, locomotive, and appetitive ends that determine what is good for non-human animals are also partially constitutive of our good. That we are rational entails that we also have as our own distinctive ends those associated with intellect and volition. Like other animals, in order to flourish, we must take in nutrients, go through a process of development from conception uh, through to maturity, reproduce ourselves, and move ourselves about in the world in response to inner drives and the information that we take in through sense organs. But on top of that, we have to exercise the rational capacities to form abstract concepts, put them together into judgments, and to reason from one judgment to another in accordance with the laws of logic. And we have to choose between alternative courses of action in light of what the intellect knows about them. Now, these latter higher rational activities do not merely constitute distinctive goods. They also alter the nature of the lower animal goods. For example, both a dog and a human being can have a visual perception of a tree. But there is a conceptual element, normal human visual perception, that is not present in the dog's perception. The dog perceives the tree, but not in a way that involves conceptualizing it as a tree, forming a judgment like that tree is an oak, or inferring from the presence of the tree and the, and the tree's status as an oak that an oak is present. In man, the animal sensory element is fused to the distinctively human rational element in such a way. Audio was weird for you. Okay. Just watch the beginning. I'm, 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 to be honest, I'm actually struggling to follow. Is it? Like and and uh, yeah, okay. So it's not just me. <coughs> ah, bloody hell. Okay, okay. So it's not just me. I'm going to go back because I did miss some of that. Logic. And we have to choose between alternative courses of action in light of what the intellect knows about them. Now, these latter higher rational activities do not merely constitute distinctive goods. They also alter the nature of the lower animal goods. For example, both a dog and a human being can have a visual perception of a tree. But there is a conceptual element, normal human visual perception, that is not present in the dog's perception. The dog perceives the tree, but not in a way that involves conceptualizing it as a tree, forming a judgment like that tree is an oak, or inferring from the presence of the tree and the, and the tree's status as an oak that an oak is present. In man, the animal sensory element is fused to the distinctively human rational element in such a way as to form a seamless unity. I mean, like, what I don't like about this is this the idea that there's like a dis like this harsh distinction between man and animal such that the man has the rational, the animal does not. I don't think that makes sense. Um, I think that it's more likely to say that what we we'll have is a reflective element such that it is the practical reasoning of the animal uh, essentially inverted, such it is such that the precepts of the animal um, or the categorization of the animal is forced to invert and categorize itself. And now we have the reflection or reflective reasoning of Aristotle. Um, and like, so like, it's, it's very much in line with things like Darwinian evolution and also, <clears throat> um, um, modular, like modular, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, sort of linear, um, small incremental increases in rational capacity such that on, once you hit a certain point, you can engage in greater and greater social skills and communication and those social skills and communication allow for essentially the uh, the uh, ends of reasoning, um, which is conceptualization. So I think that the 
or rather holding the concepts constant. So once we can once we can develop more sophisticated concepts through um, uh, a sort of incremental development of rational faculties, which are present in animals but not at the same extent, then we can engage in further social developments, which can then um, lead to uh, holding concepts constant and a perpetuation of uh, certain specific mental abilities between actors, such that we can then develop uh, deductive reasonings, uh, reasoning and uh, syllogistic logic and, and so on like that, right? Um, not degrees or levels of consciousness, I'd say degrees and levels of um, of uh, even sapience or self-awareness, but even then it's it's more about uh, it's more about awareness of how oneself is categorizing the world. It's awareness of oneself in the object of the of the analysis. I think that's bullshit, Mario. I think animals do have practical reason. Um, I actually think that it's... I think Alistair McIntyre's work on uh, in um, dependent rational animals, I think, uh, is is the best for this. And, and, you know, remember, he's a Thomist as well. So it's not as if, you know, he's he's just disagreeing with uh, some of the dogma that uh, the, the Thomistic stance has towards animals. Uh, and it's more of the radical Thomistic interpretations. And it's not even... I mean, Tom, Thomas himself is fairly, you know... Um, fairly bad when it comes towards animals, but I think Aristotle's superior. Um, and I think that the uh, the prevalence of human nature being rational misunderstands that human nature is rational only because of its animality. It's the product of animality. It's not something that just sort of a poofed and appeared out of nothing. It's specifically a condition which is um, generated, which, you know, might, de- might define us as human, but it it is... It's not the product of uh, just being a homo sapien uh, in many ways. It's the product of... Oh, were you looking for this? There's not much of that. Sorry. Stole most of it. I wouldn't mind if you pass us one of those energy drinks in. Did you do that? Thank you. Um... Yeah, I think Alistair McIntyre. I mean, to be fair, I'd, I'd put Alist, Alistair. Just it's Alistair because he's he's fancy. It's Alistair McIntyre, um, but Alistair McIntyre's. Um, I mean, he is very much inspired by Thomistic philosophy. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. I I love Alistair McIntyre. He's my favorite man, definitely. Autocorrect. Don't worry, uh, man. He, like I can't judge anyone for spelling anything wrong. Like I was, I was editing me trying to read the Declaration of Independence before, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure those. I'm pretty sure I was saying things that don't even words. Like I'm, I, I was like, I ended up just cutting that out and just, just putting in like Kevin Spacey and others reading the Declaration of Independence. Like I was just like, wow, fuck, I'm, I look like an absolute moron. Dependent Rational Animals epic, man. You want to read Dependent Rational Animals? Such a good book. So small as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that human consciousness is... Um, I mean, that animality defines human consciousness, very much so. That the species of animal is defined by the... Uh, sorry, the, spe- the genus of animal defines the species of human. Um, such that we can even talk about... when, we're, Especially when we talk about human in the Aristotelian... Aquinian sense, which is essentially rationality. Um, and I think that the, the pre-linguistic animals uh, demonstrate the, the development of, uh, of, excuse me, towards linguistic, more sophisticated communicative structures and linguistic reasoning, which we will then talk about, I think, in what is talking about here, as essentially the, the, the forms of conceptual reasoning. Because it's nothing like if you have a, a human in the woods, I don't think he'd be capable of seeing and perceiving a tree um, in the same way that Faisal's talking about here. I don't think that would be uh, that would be uh, likely. I don't know why animals would need reason for. Animals would need reason for the exact same reason that humans need reason in the relationship to the, their own flourishing. 
That's it's why animality would lead to humanity. Unless unless you don't believe in evolution in that maximum, or you don't believe there's a teleological drive, that there was a mechanism that led to the production of humanity. And that it contains a telos which essentially leads to truth seeking. And that truth seeking is allows for the expression of desire, right? So if I desire, I desire to know. If I desire to know, well, I need reason. So in the same way that if I desire to know, I need various senses, such as eyes, mouth, like, you know, well, not eye, they're not senses, but organs in order to essentially give them senses. So like sight, taste, smell, um, you know, feeling and stuff like that, like touch, like the various senses that I use to gain information from the world are, and then um, engage with the world. It's the same reason that I would need reflection so that I could test those senses and overcome essentially the uh, inadequacies of my, uh, of my base nature. Animals don't, like, I think you're looking at the process of mechanism and teleology to see it as animals desire intellection. I don't think that humans necessarily desire intellection in, like, that's not what led to humanity, humanity's existence. What led to humanity's existence was a teleological drive towards an election because it is desirable. Like, that's such that, does, that, that, the, that knowledge or truth and desire are one. Yeah, but I think that what the, the ends of desire is truth in general, such that the true and the beautiful are one. I do believe in a telos. I would agree that animals don't have, well, I don't, it depends on what you mean by knowledge, but I would agree that animals don't have knowledge. Like, I think in the way that would define it. But our, uh, McIntyre argues that they could have pheronesis. And beliefs specifically. Do animals have beliefs? McIntyre argues necessarily that they do. And I would agree. I think animals have beliefs. I, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm necessarily strictly within the Thomistic tradition. I mean, you know, I'm a Hegelian, so I don't care, right? So, like, I, it's sort of like a... I like, to, I like Thomism. I think Hegelianism is better. Um, but the... I think in general, I think that this is implicit from the foundations of the, the Thomistic tradition. Animals uh, demonstrate beliefs in their actions all the time. Um, in relation to, uh, you can see it in terms of certain behaviors, in terms of certain... Um, developments in sociality loads of stuff i don't believe that beliefs require conception at least not in the sense that that were that we're talking about no i wouldn't call it instinct i don't think animals act purely on instinct and there's a lot of dogma there and i think that like and, and i think a lot of this i think if you start holding these accounts i think you're going to end up with an anti-evolutionary take Absolutely. I don't know if I can continue this, man. Hence, while so, perception is a good for both non-human animals and humans. Well, it'd be anti-evolutionary in the sense that the reason that humanity, like, you'd have to be able to give an account for how human rationality and conceptual conceptualization comes about, rather than it just being a, a sort of accidental emergent property or something like that. Um, you'd actually have to, you'd have to deny, essentially, the, the, in, the, the evidence that we have which is to so show a development in terms of the pre-linguistic animals towards increasing conceptualization and improved linguistic skills and the capacity to hold on to beliefs to a greater and greater degree. So it, it, it seems to me that in terms of behavioral structures, in terms of communicative structures, you know, you can see, you can certainly see a difference between uh, the relationship between, um, you know, less sophisticated animals such as insects um, to, you know, cats, dogs, uh, cows, chickens, and pigs, and then the higher and more developed animals in this respect, so from pigs, uh, with dogs, pigs, and then you can go to primates, and then 
dolphins, right? So and and dolphins especially, and uh, the work on dolphins is pretty impressive, and it shows that they actually are largely capable of expressing uh, of not it's largely necessary for them to be able to hold on to beliefs and engage in uh, forms of reasoning in order for their uh, sophisticated um, hunting tactics to even function. So... Well, I think metaphysics is more certain than science, but I think that what we see is that there is a metaphysics which conforms with the empirical, and then there's a metaphysics which does not. Um, and I think that the metaphysics which places animality uh, uh, and and rationality as separable um, is nonsense. <laughs> Why don't they have language, though? Because For the same reason that there's a linear development in animals towards increasing sophistication, but not necessarily um instant uh higher levels of complexity like i 100 percent believe that animals could if left to evolve on earth like other rational animals could evolve do you not believe that like do you not think that for example if, if let's say humans were to die out that another animal another type of animal could evolve sapience and um higher level social skills Why would they evolve into humans? I mean, humanoid maybe in one respect, but like the Bible, like the Bible says that we're created in seven days. Um, that's not necessarily true. I mean, like how you understand Genesis, like Catholics don't believe that we were created in seven days. We believe it's a story to express the um, the power of God and amongst many other things. I know you're the empiricist, Mario, and it's, it's a filthy irony here, isn't it? Like, that I'm telling you that this you're empirically wrong. Of course I believe that we came from apes, yeah, 100%. I, mean, there's a, I, I believe that we came from, uh, what is it, uh, like, in, in terms of the evolutionary... Um, like, you know, the various, uh, there's a, a few species that sort of had impact upon where, where development, but I think that we can, we can see the development from, um, like, you know, from primates all the way up to, uh, to, uh, more sophisticated primates, which is us. I mean, that we're just primates. Like, there's no, there's no discounting that. Like, we're a form of ape. Like, like, come on, man. Like, 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 I mean, is is anyone in chat actually? I'm, I'm I'll be surprised if anyone in this chat actually doesn't believe in evolution. Does anyone in this chat actually not believe in evolution? I think dragons are probably metaphorical, obviously, like, there's kinds of, I think they've probably been impacted through, like, real-life animals which have existed, like, we can see lizards, um, and extrapolated, and, you know, it's possible, I mean, I watched, I remember watching this great show, um, on, uh, it was like, was it, like, fantasy made reality or something, and it was just a theoretical, it was like a hypothetical, what if dragons actually did exist and were hunted to exist uh, in, into extinction? Or like that nearly died out with the dinosaurs, but few of them survived because they were essentially more adapted. And like maybe they had like a natural ability to cook their food and that would lead to an evolutionary like advantage. It was actually such a good show. I can't remember what it was called. It was like from fantasy to reality. It was such a good show. I believe in the young earth theory. I like the young inner theory. What were the telos of dinosaurs to be big lizards, man? Big, big lizards. Have a good time. Till that big rock really did not help. <laughs> telos of dinosaurs is to become chickens, really, if you think about it, like...
I don't care about evolution. I believe a lot of people in science are wanting to in innovate the theory so i don't know i mean i think it needs work i mean obviously there's a lot of work that needs to be done in evolutionary uh, like uh, biology um and i don't think that it makes sense without a teleological mechanism but i don't think we can actually discount evolution i think the evidence for evolution is overwhelming um i mean whether it's like the the we can we can pretty much track the linear development of certain organs and animal species man Aloha, by the way. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, man. Are you in Hawaii? I'm proper jealous. I'd love to go to Hawaii. Hawaii's gorgeous. Or are you just saying aloha? I don't think that our current theory of evolution... I mean, when you say our current theory of evolution, I think that it presupposes, like like one specific theory that's winning out which i don't necessarily think's happening um i think that there's a lot of development going on in genetics uh rather than it just being like essentially but i think that the actual evolutionary process rather than how we explain it is true i just don't think that we understand the mechanism of evolution as well as we will i mean Yeah, I agree, Maximo. It requires a real teleology. Um, and I think that explains a lot. Like, you have to explain why is re uh, replication happening in order for this to have any sort of... Uh, well, for you to be able to ground this. And I think it also adds a lot of... Exp and not just explanatory benefit at the point of, a a like, you know, abiogenesis and stuff, but at the point of... Um, at the point of uh, the continued replicate... Uh, an explanation of the replica replicatory... The, the 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 replicating process, right? I have to check that out. Uh, Doctor Trevor's evolutionary psychology work on self deception. I'll have to check that out. The Darwinian theory is um, like the basis of evolutionary uh, takes, but it's not like the only one at, on the go. Like you've got, because people are arguing even in development, like so like that's only one possible avenue in which it's developing. But the Darwinian take is, um, it's like, it's not like as if evolutionary biology stopped with Charles Darwin, right? Like, Yeah, we don't know how um, amino acids turn into cells, but, what, but and more importantly, we don't know why amino acids self-replicate. And I think that what it needs is a better metaphysical understanding as to as to engage with identity such that we can understand how self-replication works. And even like stability in atoms, like why is stability, you know, why is um, like not just how, but why or what, but why do specific physical and chemical identities work in a certain way and that's what hegel wanted to do and he thought this was the job not of science and physics but of the philosophy of nature which he thought was like that with physics he's like the only di the, the only difference is we account for why <laughs> Thoughts on the idea that Descartes ripped off Augustine of Hippo? In what respect?
like I said earlier, the process for me to be makes sense, but getting A is a really big question in our current understanding. It's just a brute fact that it did without or why or how. I think that's what the science of the gaps, as you sort of say, is doing, and that's very frustrating. I hate the brute fact bullshit. I remember reading St. Augustine and thinking something about this a while ago. Um, and I think, I think I mentioned it on chat, but I can't, I, I, I don't know, man. I remember being, I remember even saying something about this, like in chat. And I'm like, I remember thinking that cheeky git. Like not in chat, like um, on stream. But I, I don't think it's like the, yeah, there's a line in on the Trinity. It was like De Trinitate. And I was reading it. I was like, that was weird. Uh, you suggest a video by joining the Discord and sending it there, G-Edit. Because, like, for whatever reason, they just never get posted. I think it just gets auto-blocked by the bot. Okay, I'll watch the video you sent. One second, let's see. Where is it? Oh, God is dead, Nietzsche. All right. Okay. <laughs> 28 minutes. It's very short. You're cheeky. You're cheeky, you. You're proper cheeky. This isn't very short at all. That's not so short. What are you talking about? That's like, that's like above average YouTube length. I'm going to start telling my, like... I do watch like our videos, but you don't tell us it's short. Like that's not short. That's like that's at least median length. That's like medium. Not short. Discord's linked in uh, the description, J. Excuse me. I'll uh I'll grab the link for you in any way. Yeah, I have watched five hour I've watched like three hour videos, right? Five hours is sick. I never watched five hour videos. At least not for a long time. This is getting clipped. So it's gonna be me like this is above average length. I, I, <laughs> like look, <laughs> you told me <laughs> this is gonna be small. This is definitely massive. <laughs> <laughs> Look, all I'm saying is that I might have had bigger, but that doesn't mean that this isn't quite large. Yeah, a five hour video would be a 10 hour stream. It really would be. You can, Shadow. I don't mind. Uh, video requests, you edit. Oh, it's chilly, isn't it? I mean, I don't know why I'm saying that to you guys. You just don't, you just don't live here. I've watched your streams for hours. Thank you, Em. I appreciate that. See, Em, uh, you see, you guys, you guys need to be more like Em. That's what she said. Yes. By the way, Dragons, a fantasy made real is on YouTube. We should watch that, man. We should actually watch that. That's so good. I'd watch that, even if that's like two hours long. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, 
some PS as well from our recorder. Classical theist. Imagine work. Okay. Give it a go. Are you tired of listening to the news? Uh. I don't know how you can have such nice music. Isn't this the guy that, uh, isn't the guy that wants an authoritarian state? Like, how can you be like, oh, we're gonna have such happy, nice music, by the way, also, get in the mines. So one of the questions I get asked a lot, um, as a Catholic, as a Thomist, and really as someone who's just a strong advocate for traditional morality, traditional ethics, the natural family, um, is how do I justify that rationally? How do I justify my natural law tradition on rational grounds? What are the arguments in its favor? And I kind of want to uh, devote this video entirely to that, specifically within the realm of sexual ethics, which is really exclusively what they have in mind when they ask that question, predictably. And I think it's quite pertinent that uh, that the rational defense for traditional ethics really gets out there in, in the public because uh, it really seems to me that as all this degeneracy is being put forward through uh, our institutions, uh, government, the public school system, the media, and that lack of philosophical and rational justification for traditional ethics has served as a vacuum that these pernicious forces can then fill in and act as though they are the only respectable uh, intellectual position to have on these matters. I mean, it's gotten to the point where you can literally not hold the opinions that your grandparents held uh, without being ostracized as some bigot and hateful right-wing extremist. And I think... I mean, there's, there's positions like there would be a point in which just because your grandparents held them doesn't mean that you're not a bigot though, right? Like, obviously it's... Like, you can't just appeal to tradition. Like, oh, it's traditional, so it's good. Like, no. Um... That wouldn't be the way. I'm not saying that it's that's what he's doing. I'm just saying, like, obviously, just this is just an emotional appeal right now, and I, I don't care. Get to the philosophy. I think part of the reason for that uh, is because we don't actually have very many sophisticated philosophical arguments to uh, put forward in the conversation, and so they just see uh, moral and social conservatism as just some brute outward expression of. Uh, inner instinctive disgust that arises from bigotry. Um, no, I think that they just think that you're following a tradition without cause, right? So, like, like the, it's the project of the Enlightenment taken to its nth degree. Whether that's right or wrong, it that's one thing. But like, people are asking essentially for justification for the positions you have, and not just to be a blind conservative. Um, so, which I, I think is fair. Um, uh, and I think this is very regrettable because really both sides of the aisle only constitute a fraction of the range of philosophical approaches to this issue. And in my estimation, the most powerful moral argument against uh, sexual degeneracy, um, and within that category, I'm including, I think, the following categories of uh, sexual behavior that would be uh, homosexuality, certainly, uh, contraception, pornography, uh, just these kinds of acts. 
I mean, a popular slogan on this channel, of course, is, you know, fat is degeneracy. We all agree with that. But why do we agree with that? And that's the question that I'm going to try to explore with. I think there's nothing in itself wrong with homosexual acts. Um, I want to know why I'm supposed to look at homosexuals as degenerates when they're in a love and committed relationship. I think there's nothing wrong there. Uh, some arguments from my own natural law tradition uh, in moral philosophy which stands as the official means of theologizing and philosophizing moral matters in the Catholic Church. Uh, its usefulness, though, is not limited to the confines of the Church. And as will be shown, I think we can deduce from natural reason alone its usefulness and rational unavoidability, particularly as applicable to these moral issues that I just mentioned. Uh, before we can uh, construct an argument for natural law against any specific act, though, a sufficient understanding of natural law as well as a philosophical justification uh, for it as the correct system of ethics by which human acts are judged to be licit or illicit, um, I think is an order. Uh, so first, what do I mean by natural law? Uh, this basic question is more pivotal to this topic than may be immediately apparent, for in many cases, advocates for uh, these uh, modes of sexual behavior that a lot of people advocate for, uh, they dismiss arguments against their cause uh, from natural law based on a misunderstanding of what natural law actually is. So to understand this, it may be helpful to clarify what's... I agree. If I hear the is old gap one more time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fucking shoot myself. ...meant by the words nature and law in the context of natural law for a great many objections I think are predicated upon a misunderstanding of one or the other. So nature in this theoretical framework does not refer uh, to that which is produced by artifice, right, by artifacts such as, you know, a toothbrush or a house maybe, a computer, uh, nor does it refer to that which is of itself relating to the outdoors. Um, instead, nature refers to really essence, as in, you know, the nature of a plant. In other words, it refers fundamentally to that which makes a thing the kind of thing that it is, as opposed to some other thing. It is the nature of a triangle. The reason for something's existence, or the form of something's existence, I think would probably be the best way of... For example, that it be a three-sided polygon. Now, definitionally speaking... Not up to date viewer 3 tipped four pounds and 20 pence. Oh, hey man, I'm a vegan atheist intrigued by your faith. Why, how Christianity? To me, God, is just a label for man-made, human-centric concepts. I think exploring the depths of reality might only reveal more about ourselves than actual truth. Thoughts? Uh, thank you very much for the donation. Um, I certainly believe that exploring the depths of reality will reveal more about ourselves, but I think that the only way that you could even say that you're revealing more about yourself is to say that you're revealing an actual truth which you could know about yourself. Um, like, first and foremost, otherwise it it sort of, um, it wouldn't make sense. Um, I think that fundamentally the Christian God is discoverable through a form of metaphysical analysis and natural reason um, such that we can come to the truths that are expounded within the Catholic Catechism and Scripture um, through observation of uh, reality alone, through arguments such as the principle of sufficient reason, um, so an, uh, an observation of natural teleology um, uh, as being necessary. So it, it's sort of... Um, I, I, Christianity, because I I would argue it seems to be the one that is most well founded, um, but I think that there are these truths in other religions as well um, that not as um, mature as the Catholic approach, but certainly well developed in certain other religions, uh, more or less depending upon the religion, and that can be judged through natural reason and um, an uh, a, 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 a research into the actual tradition itself. Um, Yeah, um, I think that it would be a mistake to remove agency from, and I, I'm imagining that you're sort of leaning this way, that, you know, obviously agency is very much tied into our understanding of reality, right? Like, such that we can, um, 
um, such that we can we can say that okay, well, the the structures, the epistemological structures, which allow us to know and consider anything are relative to the conceptual framework within our society and our culture um such that we we see the world through ourselves and i think that would be fair enough and rather than argue against that because i don't disagree because I, I certainly take a phenomenal approach i think that the phenomenal approach leads us towards the truth of the self which is a one oneness with reality um and that the, the absolute truth rather than an objective truth or a subjective truth, the absolute truth, it unites the, these two extremes, the subject and the object, such that the subject is conforming to the object and the object to the subject in relation to logical relations which pre-exist what can actually be thought and uh, motivated from the position that we're in. So, in many ways, um, I think that the... It's fair enough to say that, you know, obviously that there is this, even like this, it's not an epistemological distance, but there is this epistemological self-relation of reality and that we do gain knowledge about ourselves in relation to reality. But the only way that we can gain knowledge of ourselves is, an, is a relationship to uh, an objective frame framework where we already presume that we can be the objects of other subjectivity in a common domain uh, and so presume uh, the truth of objectivity in the first place. So I think that, you know, deep metaphysical introspection into reality will lead you towards a Christian approach and not away from it. Uh, but thank you very much for, for your question. I'm taking this from Aristotle. Uh, nature is defined accordingly. The nature of a thing, then, is a certain principle and cause of change and stability in a thing, and it is directly present in it, which is to say that it is present in its own right and not coincidentally. And I'm taking that from the Physics, Book 2, Part 1. So, in other words, nature refers to the inner substance of what a thing fundamentally is, which remains changeless in the face of change, whence springs its various ends, inclinations, powers, and movements belonging properly to the thing in question. It refers to, simply speaking, the essence or substance of the thing in question. Now, as to law, uh, per St. Thomas Aquinas, he says the following, A law is a rule and measure of acts, whereby man is induced to act or is restrained from acting, for lex is derived from legare, precisely because it binds one to act. Uh, so St. Thomas goes on to explain that the only rule and measure of human acts uh, must be reason since it is reason that directs the ends and movements of all human acts that can be properly so called. And it is the rule and measure of human acts that pertains to natural law. Therefore, given these two clarifications of nature and law, it would stand to reason that, taken together, natural law would pertain to the rule and measure of human acts through the mode of a particular rational creature, i.e. a human being. Natural law, however, cannot be said to exist in a vacuum, since it is inherently derivative. And what can I begin to understand natural law without reference to that from which natural law is derived? This would be what St. Thomas would refer to as the eternal law. Now, the eternal law is a term uh, synonymous with the divine logos, or the divine reason, who fashions the natures of all things and directs them towards their ends that flow uh, from their essences as conceived in the divine mind. Uh, natural law, then, principally, can be said to consist in man's cooperation with the eternal law whereby he partakes in the providence of God insofar as he uh, respects his God-given nature by living in conformity with what his reason discerns his nature to be in its pure form, abstracted by his intellect and therefore reflective of how God conceived it. Uh, that which is in right conformity to the authentic being of his nature is the good, and that which deviates from the authentic... Sure, but like, okay, I, I'm willing to agree man and all other animals have an essence such that they have a reason which um allows for which gives a explanation for their existence or their particular instantiation the unity of this reason in time and you know beyond such it essentially is their substance and without matter their essence 
the the um the so they have this fundamental substance that is essentially separable from the the specific particulars of their experience although made concrete and manifest in those in that particularity sure um that these reasons define the will's relation to the self so that the the will is actually trying to will itself it's a form of self-actualization sure and explains the dynamis that's what aristotle says um and that's the foundations of teleology such that we are driven towards specific ends or the specific or the culminations of the reasons of our existence yeah sure makes sense um how do we understand and learn this nature um and what is the fundamentals of this nature that's the questions that need to be asked um how am i not dead i should be dead he could have killed me um Um, he should have killed me. Um, I had it been torn, I might have won. Big being of his nature is evil as evil is none other than a privation or a lack of a of of being really this is a fundamental precept of the natural law upon which the specific precepts are based good is to be sought after and evil avoided this is the first precept because goodness is convertible with being on this view and being is the first and most preeminent of realities apprehended by the intellect so likewise goodness is the first and preeminent sought after by the will which proceeds from the intellect since the good is none other than being as sought after by the will it is properly understood as an end a term which refers to the teleological inclinations that tend beyond a substance towards some good that fulfills some appetite or inclination the first specific precept of the natural law though uh is understood through the lens of teleology and is uh the self-perpetuation of one's existence this is numerically listed first as it is the most basic and causally conditions the others since one's existence precedes one's manner of existence thus whatsoever concerns the preservation of one's life whether it be the positive pursuit of goods or the prevention of evils is of the natural law the second precept uh, which is common to all animals is the procreative faculty that tends toward the generation and bearing and rearing of children. Now this, this is double check what he said there. Goods that the it's the others. Since one directly listed is, uh, is understood through the list some good that fulfills some appetite or inclination. The first specific precept of the natural law though uh, is understood through the lens of teleology and is uh the self-perpetuation of one's existence this yeah. is numerically listed so as a self-actualization right first as it is the most basic and causally conditions the others i mean it it really is just the continued quality of your being it's like the perpetuation of your own existence is only essentially the quality to attempt to achieve your ends since one's existence precedes one's manner of existence thus whatsoever concerns the preservation of one's life whether it be the positive pursuit of goods or the prevention of evils is of the natural law the second precept uh which is common to all animals is the pro but it's it's not just the perpetuation of your life though it's of a certain like the whole point is that your life is it, it, the your life is conditioned such that there is a right way of living and being and that is appropriate and uh and um and uh foundational for your existence not just life itself like if you could imagine i think in uh, i would certainly say that you can imagine from the teleological standpoint that uh, a continued existence in a certain uh at the expense of certain conditions could go against your teleology such that the you undermine the truth of your own existence um by perpetuating your own existence and or, or like you're frustrating your telos um I would certainly say so. It's not just merely living, it's it's essentially the truth of your being. Creative faculty that tends toward the generation and bearing and rearing. 
I agree that it prece- it, it precedes essence. I certainly agree there. Um, but in the sense that obviously that, uh, but only so far as that it can lead to the actualization of essence. Like if it frustrates the the truth of your being or the or your essence, then it no longer is, is a good in itself, right? Of children. Now, this precept is, of course, going to be of central focus uh, to this video, since the sexual behaviors I mentioned, uh, homosexuality, contraception, what have you, uh, these are going to be argued to be deviations from the good that ought to be sought after uh, from this precept. I'm just wondering how he's going to say homosexuality goes against the good that's sought after since homosexuality isn't a choice. So it's like, okay, so it's a first, let's say we just assume it's a frustration of our natural lens, which is to reproduce, fair enough, whatever, uh, the perpetuation of the species and all that. Yeah, okay, but it's not a choice, so they can't do it. So like, I, I don't, I don't know. Okay, there's one sort of issue sort of uh, removed from the person's uh, point. So now I have to say the homosexual act specifically rather than the, the being homosexual is uh or an inability to reproduce is the issue so they can't reproduce fair enough that goes beyond their natural teleology it's frustrated um and it's beyond their beyond their uh power to resolve um okay why should that mean that they should never engage in a mutually beneficial loving relationship uh with another homosexual person um And the third precept chiefly concerns man's reason, the highest good uh, sought after being God himself, as he is the substance of truth itself, which is that towards which reason is inclined. Uh, indeed, this ultimate end of the third precept constitutes the highest good attainable by man, which is the vision of the absolute unconditioned truth itself, which is God's essence. Uh, this is a natural desire of sorts, but many medieval scholastics debate the extent to which this obediential potency that they call it is called neither natural or supernatural. That's kind of neither here nor there. Uh, now, one may object by inquiring why exactly one ought to identify the good with the inclination to man's teleology. Now, this objection ultimately cuts to the heart of whether the entire basis upon which natural law is built stands to rational scrutiny, so I think it's important to address. Um, this objection really has its spiritual uh, roots in um, Humean philosophy, in, in, in my judgment, which argues that it is rationally untenable to insist upon a moral ought as derivative of an ontological. It's not derived from Humean philosophy. I mean, the is or gap is just the logical the logical uh, deduction from a nominalist position which Hume explicated, but it comes to how we understand nature, which was to be free of un real universals from the Protestant nominalist position, right? So... Is. In other words, just because something is uh, the way it is, does that necessarily entail any moral obligations associated therewith? This objection, however, fails to fully understand what is precisely meant by the good. Uh, the word good has been in my view, debased in its connotation and fails to get at the heart of what the natural uh, law theorist really means by the term. Um, the good, according to the natural... I mean, there's a rejection of the Aristotelian metaphysic, which defines the good as being the same as as, as being the same as being, right? So, like, that's the that's the, the issue. This is why we get the Azor gap. So it's just the logical conclusion of this metaphysic. Um... But again, like, that's not telling me why, like, how you know that it is in man's interest to not allow homosexuals to live loving, happy relations, have having, loving, happy relations, right? Like, I don't, um, like, I don't, I don't see what, how this actually, like, yeah, sure, it goes against, like, like, we shouldn't be opting to only sleep in homosexual relationships, but I don't think that's necessarily a choice anyway. Um, and you know, the perpetuation of the species is a good that we should seek. Okay. Um, under certain circumstances, which we can know would be dependent upon the, the conditions in which individuals are living with. So that's why just simply being the number of like, you don't want to fall into the, the trap of saying that simply the more people there is, the more good that it is. Cause that's a lot of shit. Um, it's about the lived experiences of the members of the species, not just a sort of abstract concept or, or abstract quantity. Um, cause then you've lost the. What, the, what it means for the species to actually be and you've just conflated the uh the uh the existence with the species with the essence of the species um like or sheer existence without essence as being a good um so that would be wrong so i'm just wondering like so if we take all that into account we can see that there are certain conditions that need to be met to allow for the flourishing of individuals in homosexual cases that 
that can't reproduce. It's frustrating for them in some respects. It's frustrating for the species, more specific, more specifically, um, and the good of the species. They can't do anything about that. Why does stopping them having a marriage help? I don't. I don't. It gets to there. Okay. A law theorist is none other than being as sought after by the will. It is in fact convertible with being, according to Saint Thomas. For if it were not, where do you get goodness from? It seems to me that when we speak of goodness, we inevitably imply that something has been perfected in some way. Uh, and if you take a look at perfection conceptually and you analyze it logically, uh, it would seem to me that you come to the logical, logically inevitable conclusion that uh, you can't understand perfection itself without reference to being. Because if something is perfected, uh, as for example, a triangle is... Yeah, but it's not being, like I just want to point out, that it's not just being in the abstract. It's being in, in its unity with truth, such that perfection is the unity of being and essence, which was the pre-existent essence within being and the truth of being. So it's not like abstract quality is good, like just be. It's just your existence is good. It's like specifically the the unity of identity or the absolute is good, like and that that's what we're talking about. So the unity of being and essence is good, such that the the essence conforms to the conditions the preconditions of being and and the right or a wrong way of being right is perfected to the degree that it conforms to its geometrical definitions or a heart is perfected to the degree to which it uh functions properly as a heart uh these perfections are, f flow from the nature of what it is to be a specific thing that is called good and that is determined by being that's determined by the actuality of a thing according to its nature it's the thing it's according to its nature i agree i agree i'll thank you for the donation man seb tipped four pounds and 20 pence what do you mean or intend when you say logical relations pre-exist would you elaborate explicate that further thank you um I can't remember what I said in what respect, like in the sense that I say that uh, self-relation, identity relations, I mean like in terms of like a logos, in terms of the thing which gives, uh, in terms of what gives an explanation of uh, real identities in the world, uh, specifically uh, CEP, if that makes sense. So um, uh, a relationship between um, a thing and itself, a, um, a thing and other objects or um most cogently the uh you could think of it as the transcendental foundations for experience uh, entire D does that answer the question so the preconditions of having experience of a thing or identities or the existence of any identity Yeah, I would say, well, I would argue from a Hegelian perspective that ontology, like metaphysics and logic are actually one. Um, I don't believe in a kind of, like, obviously analytic philosophy will take, will sort of divest logic and formal logic specifically away from ontology. I don't think that it makes sense to do that. Obviously, I think that the study of logic um, is separable to the study of ontology in this respect. Like, you can study, like, a formal logic, and that's fine. But I think it gains its roots and its reality from a real identity relation that exists in in concrete experience or just in experience, right? It's something that is um, not built from sort of abstract axioms or anything like that, which I think is a, essentially a form of maybe even quantitative science. Um Like akin to mathematics.
Uh, yeah, I take existence and reality as as synonyms here. Um, Oh, uh, did I answer your question there, CEP? Or is there anything that you'd like clarified? I'll go as soon as I make sure that I've gave the man his money's worth. How am I, man? Like, let, let the... Yeah, absolutely, CEP. You're welcome to come on if you want. Like, 100%. Um, so that's no. Uh, I'll watch this and then I'll take call-ins conformity to essentially what it is and this is to agree with uh, the actuality of a thing the being of a thing and so you can't understand perfection apart from uh being so much less can we understand goodness apart from being uh i'm furthermore just as a kind of side argument uh if goodness is not ultimately derived from being then goodness would really i think be reduced to, so to some singular entity among other entities it's very yeah, you end up with this uh, good, good as a noun rather than an adjective. Existence and manner thereof would be sh rather. shrouded in ambiguity and dubiousness. Why even propose its existence? Where can it be found? How does it exist? Uh, what evidence is there to show, to show that it does exist? Uh, there is simply no evidence whatsoever for the existence of any entity called be goodness. Well, I mean, this is this is what Alistair McIntyre argues was the, essentially the the uh, linguistic shift in our use of the word good where it stopped being a adverb and started to refer to uh, a noun specifically with the uh, the advent of um like sort of secular morals and like you say like it's my morals or or these are my my values that is not simply synonymous or directly derivative of being that is sought after by the will it simply doesn't exist especially because any entity existing outside of being uh, is simply cuts it constitutive of non-being and unless proponents of this objection are trying to imply that there exists some individual entity called goodness subject to spatio-temporal relations then i think the Thomistic notion of goodness should suffice so now that i mean i don't know why it would have to be subject to sp spatio-temporal relations when it could be subject to just logical relations and you would get loads of non-naturalists who would argue this and they'll even argue that it supervenes upon uh, upon our, our nature, but it's not akin to our nature. Our supervenes with our being, but it's not akin to our nature. Um, so there, I like not a th like I don't agree with non naturalism, but it's not fair to say that non naturalism would have to be arguing for a good particle like t jump. You know what I mean? Like they're not they're not that stupid. Go on. Natural law has been sufficiently explained and defined <laughs> as to its essence. One can use the principles derived uh, from what has been said in order to engage. Uh, in the ruling and measuring of particular human acts, such as, uh, per the thesis of this video, uh, homosexual acts, contraception, and the like. Now, these, I think, you know, don't really need to be defined, but to kind of illustrate that which connects them all together, I'll use uh, homosexual acts as just an example. At least, can you know, be defined as any activity between two persons of the same sex that is sexual in nature, that is, of or pertaining to the organs of generation and the associative pleasures derived therefrom, directly or indirectly. And so that, of course, is in common with contraception in as much as uh, the organs pertaining to the generation of offspring, and we all know what those are, uh, they are used in a sexual manner, but they are used in such a way that they, of themselves, in principle, exclude the possibility or the potentia, you know, the potency, the potentiality, uh, the intrinsic potentiality for uh, a procreative end. I mean, yes, but whether that is obviously the like just because they are even have the 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 sort of procreative um, just because they have the like what we like i think it would be it would be nonsensical to say that like obviously the remember this is secondary that the procreative end is such an end only in such that it like only in so far that it, it reflects the good of the species right so 
procreation is good depending upon condition x not procreation is good right so we can say that you know that specific condition would be tied to the flourishing of the species and the flourishing of the species i think also contains a pleasure principle um and you know we could say that love also um is good and um leads to the flourishing of uh the species love is enhanced by intimacy or can be enhanced by intimacy i don't think there'll be anything wrong with saying that people might disagree uh be willing to hear them out um Yeah, so like, so it's sort of like, um, sure, uh, it's a good qualified in a qualified sense. Um, it's a good for the species in a qualified sense. It brings meaning to the reproductive act, but not to pleasure itself. I think pleasure itself actually brings greater meaning to the act than, uh, than the, uh, <laughs> Not just the act, but the uh, the experience uh, is very much tied to pleasure, such that uh, the experience of happiness and well being of of uh, of beauty of goodness is very much tied to our or like uh, to our flourishing is the experience of flourishing. So, like, I don't know why we would say like it's only for this good. Like, I see. Well, we'll see. Maybe, maybe and, clarify. You know, that is also in common with, you know, FAP and uh, all kinds of you know, sexually degenerate behavior. And we'll get into more implications of that. Um, so since natural law determines whether specific acts are morally licit or illicit uh, based upon their ontic relation to human nature, I think an examination of human nature with respect to its sexual component is in order. Um, now, it is a matter of scientific fact, really, that uh, sexual attack, attraction and uh, that kind of pleasure in and of themselves is derived principally from the reproductive system. Without the reproductive system, there would exist no sexual attraction or sexual pleasure. Therefore, it can be said that sexual pleasure and sexual attraction... And but why does the reproductive system exist? So, like, you're putting the cart before the horse. Like, the reproductive exists for the flourishing and the, uh, the relationship of yourself... Uh, to your existence so your being in essence right so it's for the good of the species so that the species can continue it's not a good in itself so you don't say like oh it's given meaning because of its relation to reproduction sure but why does reproduction exist why is self-replication a thing what what's this how does this relate to teleology right like reproduction yeah so i agree it relates to reproduction but what's the good of reproduction it's not a good in itself by extension, sexual activity. This is where Hegel would just like hamstring it. These are unintelligible of themselves apart from their relation to the reproductive organs from which springs such attractions. But I would say that reproduction itself is unintelligible except for in the relation of a flourishing of the species, which is which contains pleasure, right? Like there is a good, an actual experiential good. and pleasures to begin with. Uh, since that is the case, uh, the rule and measure of human acts, natural law, uh, must look to the sources in which those attractions and pleasures adhere and discern their proper ends relative to those attractions and pleasures for which they exist. This discernment will be- Yeah, I'm saying that the only, uh, that reproduction isn't the only telos of sex, and moreover, that reproduction isn't its own end, like, isn't an end in itself. We're the end in itself. Uh, so it's not, like, reproduction is- for the perpetuation of the species essence for the good of the species but not like it isn't it isn't the good of the species be done but first uh, to explain the moral significance of this discernment more fully consider the following thought experiment if they exist for their own sake then it would be morally licit to seek those pleasures out for their own sake independently of whatever ends coexist with them so long as uh, such a pursuit were also in conformity with other moral norms if, however, these pleasures and attractions do not exist for their own sake, and if they are only conditionally uh, existent in subordination to a more fundamental end which defines and delimits that type of pleasure or attraction being discussed, then seeking out those pleasures and attractions would only be morally licit insofar 
as they are sought after in accordance with what reason can discern as to the nature of what that fundamental end is. Yeah, I mean, they would have to be good. They'd have to essentially improve our, te- or, uh, like, add towards our teleological relations. It seems all acts uh, would essentially only be justified in relation to forwarding, our, forwarding us towards our teleology. Um, I think that would be fair enough to say, yeah. Um, and its circumstantial boundaries in the order of human acts. This is because if those pleasures and attractions are indeed existent within that ontological context, then separating those pleasures and attractions from that fundamental end in principle would render those pleasures and attractions entirely unintelligible, for they would be cut off from that which gives the meaning in the first place, and that which cannot be separated in principle can only be separated in practice under the pain of acting against reason, which is the ont. Wait, I don't know. I don't know how we've managed to jump from like. I don't think that anyone's saying that sex shouldn't be done for reproduction, or that sex isn't derive doesn't derive its meaning from sexual dimorphism, which is which exists for the to express a good of reproduction, um, amongst other goods. Um, like some people might think that, but I think you can also hold the view that homosexuality. In a loving relationship is fine, um, and that the uh, and send. Uh, let's see what I can do here. Oh, that was not what I was looking for. Give it a taunt. Oh. Okay, yeah, so that uh, something like love in a homosexual relationship is fine if it's a committed, uh, like, marriage um, towards the, so that, so long as they will the end of each other, that would be absolutely fine. Um, but it's not able to fulfill the end of reproduction. It's not their fault. Uh, it's not a choice. So, like, no different, really, to sterility in that respect. Um so I, I don't I don't see uh I don't see how it would would be implicit basis upon which moral evil is principally understood according to natural law theory. For again, reason is the rule and measure of human acts. So acting against reason is acting against what the rule and measure of human acts dictates uh, as to what constitutes a morally good or morally evil one. Therefore, acting in a manner contrary to reason by formally participating precisely in the irrationality of that act whose nature is derived of itself from an error in the speculative reason. As, for example, removing sexual pleasure from the fundamental end for which it exists and has meaning by enjoying it without any relation to that fundamental end. This is simply to commit. But it wouldn't be about removing it from the fundamental end. You're placing the, this is the problem. Then this is, this is the problem I had from this, uh, from this Thomistic point. If we're seeing that the being is fundamental and this is actually secondary, then reproduction is secondary to the good of the being right which is why like many of the i'm pretty sure saint augustine even talks about this why there would be no sexual dimorphism in heaven because there's no re- need to reproduce the goodness isn't defined by our reproduction our reproduction is good only in a way to continue the species and hopefully produce positive ends for the species but there's times in which reproduction would be a necess- would be would be bad and we should not actually perform it such that you are going to perpetuate harm against the species itself so it's kind of like existence isn't good in itself there are certain conditions for flourishing that need to be met and those conditions for flourishing imply that you can flourish without reproduction if you can flourish without reproduction i don't see why you couldn't see that sex was for something other than and allow for a kind of flourishing that was not just reproductive for flourishing right so Um, well, yeah, I think that homosexuality means that you can't have a loving relationship, a he- loving heterosexual relationship. Like, I, I do think that, which implies that you can't have a-, a loving relationship in which you reproduce. So I do think that it's a frustration in that respect. An evil act. So now that the moral significance of what exactly is ontologically constitutive of the reproductive organs has been outlined in the form of this dilemma, such a discernment can take place. Again, Referencing the settled science on the matter, the human reproductive system is entirely unintelligible both philosophically and scientifically apart from its relation to the product of human offspring and the biological means by which that offspring is brought into being, that is, sexual intercourse between one man and one woman. 
But then let's remember that nature itself is only made intelligible by our desire and our desire to know and express, uh, to actually achieve fundamental ends such that we enjoy ourselves. Enjoyment makes, forms the bedrock of epistemology in general, such that the system of needs and the system of drives needs to be taken into consideration at the, at the, bed, at, at the very point of existence, such that experience, not mere existence, forms the foundation of reality. Otherwise, you just end up in this abstract idea that being a, a sort of abstract existence is good. Since both reproductive organs are specifically designed in... I mean, yeah, that's Hegel. I'm a Hegelian. Like, I'm, I'm, I know I'm a Hegel. Like, I know I'm a Hegelian. Like, I, like, I think Hegel was right. I think Aquinas was wrong. Yeah, like, I, I always say that, like, Hegel is a post... Um, one second. Uh... Two, three, five. Oh, damn it. So I'll have to do. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, I say this. I say that Hegel is a post Kantian Aristotelian, right? Or like in the very, in very many ways, like that's why he agrees with Thomas Aquinas. And that's why I don't say I'm a. Um, a Thomist. Oh, Hegel's against everything, man. Hegel's against animal liberation. Hegel's against women's liberation. Hegel's against everything. Like Heg Hegel, specifically, like does not see women as like even having the same capacity to reason. I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't like what Hegel specifically is against. Like there's Hegelianism, and then there's Hegel. Um, but I mean, I, to be honest, I think that Heg Hegel was very much uh, biased. Like to be honest, like his positions on these things aren't really defensible. Um, such a teleological structure that one cannot be fully understood without reference to the other. Uh, I mean, you say that I'm sure Hegel has a reason, but like, yeah, but also in the same way that he has a reason to reject animals and the same way that he has a reason to reject women having education. I'm not claiming that he had no reason, I'm saying he had bad reasons. Uh, by the way, I'm going to quickly bear it back while I've got the opportunity.
I'm back. Hegel's not gibberish. Hegel, Hegel's amazing. Um, but uh, Hegel doesn't agree with homosexuality because of the same reason um, of like Aquinas and Aristotle. Specifically that he thinks that, well, for a few reasons, he thinks that um, we have the desire for immortality that Aristotle sort of mentions, that man reproduces for a desire of immortality such that we are reproducing ourselves and it's a perpetuation of ourselves through time. Um, and I think that's a good. I don't disagree. Um, I think reproduction is definitely a good, given certain circumstances. Um, that it allows for the unity of two people. Um, obviously, that is the loving unity of the 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 the, the parents. Absolutely, given certain conditions. Yeah. Um, and that's why it's against homosexuality, which doesn't do that. It's just obviously homosexuality is not a choice they aren't actively deliberately frustrating the capacity to have children and this loving partnership which would allow them to reproduce um so nothing they can really do about it it's a natural frustration right um so yeah and again like we do need to uh we do need to remember that reproduction is only a good in relation to the flourishing of the species, not a good in and of itself, which Aristotle actually um, even um, uh, references. Aristotle makes a point about that. So, having gay sex is a choice, yes, but there's nothing wrong with having gay sex, right? If you are in a loving relationship and you're looking to satisfy each other towards a good. And I think that in many ways, right, like we can see. The fundamental tenets and psychological relation of humanity such that flourishing is made manifest in, let's say, the philosophy of someone like Slavoj Žižek in a psychoanalytic account, which shows that an abstract moral principle, which is what I think this is going to become, is going to be insufficient without a pleasure principle, without an, an act of enjoyment of one's experience. Um, and that sexuality forms a, com a, a, a component and even a large component of the enjoyment of one's, uh, uh, of the enjoyment of intimacy and love with your partner. Um, it doesn't have to be about the sexual pleasure, but even just specifically the intimacy and love between them, um, which can be made manifest through sexual pleasure. There is simply no way to understand the nature of masculinity without reference to femininity. These are real relations to the human substance that uh, share utterly in the human substance, but at the same time... Well, I mean, like, like when we say that real relations in the human substance, like... I mean, it's kind of debatable, right? Like, it's whether the soul... Like, I mean, it, it defines, it defines our humanity in one sense. It does. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not, I'm not arguing against sexual dimorphism, but when we'd look towards someone like St. Augustine and this, con and the conversations that were around that time of like, whether the soul is gendered and like, unless you're saying that the soul isn't the, like form the, forms the bedrock and the, the meaning and the reason for our existence. And if the soul's not gendered, well, that changes everything, right? Like, there's no need for sex. So it's kind of like, well, there's no need for sex in heaven because there's no need for reproduction, right? Like, that's the idea of, like, St. Augustine, right? So sexual dimorphism won't exist because, essentially, sexual reproduction is for the benefit of the species. It doesn't define the species. Is your position that gay people must fulfill their sex lives and must do so by having gay sex? I'm just saying, no. Like, what I'm saying is that like, I don't think you need to have sex at all. I think chastity is a virtue. You can choose abstinence, right? That's the idea of the 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 life of uh, of Catholic priests, right? You can do that. I'm not saying that you can't, right? Um, I'm saying that it's difficult for people. Um, it's not for everyone. And uh, for those that it's inappropriate for, the best expression of your sexual relation is in a loving relationship, one made manifest by respect and mutual consideration. So, uh, no, the position doesn't fall apart. Like, 
and unless you also think that like everyone like do you really like are, are you actually telling me you should only have sex for for reproductive purposes and then all of that times be be absolutely chaste and you think that's a reasonable standard such that you know sex for pleasure in a um in a heterosexual relationship would be a sin right because that's what you have to you don't have to argue that sex for pleasure or sex sex for loving intimacy within a heterosexual relationship would be a sin time considered in and of themselves are unintelligible without reference to each other furthermore the production of offspring does not exist in a vacuum since the production of offspring is intrinsically connected to human sexuality by extension the very idea of an offspring and its definitional implications are also inextricably linked to human sexuality which includes uh, the bearing and rearing necessary for the offspring to one day live independently of its natural caretakers so what does this mean in reference to the fundamental point discussed previously about natural law uh, it means that sexual pleasure and sexual attraction are unintelligible apart from the organs from which they are derived, defined, and- But how are the organs made intelligible, and why do the organs exist? ...delimited, and since those organs of themselves are unintelligible- It's like, I'm interpreting the world through a thing- Like, what you're doing is you're taking a naive realist interpretation of the world, which presents the function as only through sexual reproduction. Like, I'm happy to say it's one of the functions, right? Yeah, 100%. And you take that as the only end. There's no reason to think that it's the only end, and it doesn't also have it. It doesn't also mean that there's an explanation for the reproductive purposes in the first place. Like, why care about reproduction? What's the good of reproduction? Apart from their relation to one another, male and female respectively, as well as to the natural end of the production, bearing, and rearing of offspring, then it logically follows that sexual pleasure and sexual attraction is also unintelligible. Both apart from their relation to a male and female union, as well as to the relation to the production of uh, offspring. And How is sexual attraction made unintelligible? Uh, I don't think that, 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 think that's a bit far. Like, I don't think sexual attraction is made unintelligible. Like, he's saying that gay people are gaslighting themselves into homosexuality. I, I, I don't understand. Like, obviously you can't understand homosexuality. Um, maybe you couldn't understand it outside of, like, without its relation to heterosexuality, sure. You can't understand it, it's not unintelligible. The bearing and rearing of that offspring. All of these things are intrinsically connected and cannot be separated, in principle, without rendering the entirety of the system unintelligible to the intellect. So, what does this mean in relation to natural law? Well, since to separate one of these things from the rest would render the entirety of the system unintelligible and hence contrary to reason, and since it is wholly through reason by which anything is intelligible at all, then to separate one of these things from the rest in practice would also be contrary to reason, and as such would be participatory in an ontological evil. Only so far as it led to the frustration of the species essence, right? As long as it led to the frustration or, preve or, like an, or in some way prevented the flourishing, but that's not what's happening in a loving homosexual relationship, right? So, like, the frustration would be no different to the, like, they aren't the ones who are engaging in an act which is frustrating their natural telos. Like, that's not really their choice, right? Like, I don't, like, it, it would be the, yeah, if, if, if they chose to be gay, right? Like, yes, okay, I guess. But unless you're choosing gay, you aren't doing anything that yes i understand that it's a choice to engage in the act but the uh, the but the frustration occurs in the being right in the drive right it's not in the act like the the frustration of having the loving union necessary for procreation from a catholic perception occurs in their in their existence right so it's not it's not like Oh yeah, like they're just choosing to frustrate their natural ends. They're, no, they're, it's no different as sterility. Because gay, se well, because sex in general doesn't have a single end, and the other ends of sex can be expressed in order to build intimacy and a loving relationship such that other people can be recognized, which is part of the ontological good of the species, and actually forms the ontological good 
uh, the basis of all ontological goods, such that the pleasure principle is satisfied. Like a life without pleasure is devoid of meaning. Um, and I don't, I, 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 unless unless you're saying that it it it, it is, uh, it isn't rather. And so, sexual pleasure in a in the correct setting is a good thing. Yeah, it has one of the ends lacking, given the circumstances, like certain contexts. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, heterosexual relations can have the ends lacking in certain cons in certain uh, uh, relations to the species, in the relationship between the family and the the universal of the species, but. You see, you've added the word necessary end. When you say necessary end, that you've added something there. Uh, you kind of smuggled that one in. It has an end. Um, I mean, I, I even agree. It, it, it has an end that, uh, you know, is the, makes intelligible the act in many ways. and makes intelligible sexual dimorphism, which is, but that's only made intelligible for the good of the species. So the good of the species is the good of the individual lived experiences of its members and not some sort of abstract uh, reality, right? It's part of the foundation of human flourishing. It's, it doesn't follow that all reproduction is good. Like, there are times in which reproduction is actually a frustration of our flourishing, right? Like, if you were to reproduce when... There's a limitation of resources and such to the point in which you basically create too many mouths to feed. You are actively frustrating the good of the species. Well, no, clearly, Maximo, you're taking that out of context. That's not how that works. And you've heard me talk about incest and why incest wouldn't be the same as homosexuality. Right, like the like the psychological component in which people are uh, coerced and manipulated, the likelihood of producing someone who is harmed, um, in the same way as like producing someone who is harmed in a heterosexual relationship, which would lead to their or like you know, and I even talked about this on stream in relation to uh, people being harmed uh, from the transmission of sexual sexually transmitted diseases, like two people with HIV might, um might use contraceptive in a loving relationship in order to prevent uh, the actualization of a child which would suffer otherwise. I don't think there would be a problem there. When you say it's safe incest, I don't, I don't know what you mean there. Like, because I, I said, like, like, and this is what you said last time, where we got to the point in which we've removed all of the risks of incest, where we're having to presuppose they've never met each other, they're, they're not psychologically manipulating and they're not recognize and not capable of recognizing each other, uh, such that there's no coercion or narcissism or manipulation there. Um, and then also, they're definitely not going to have a child of incest, which is going to be uh, deformed and struggle and suffer and die prematurely like like these are the kind of things that you, you're saying like all right we'll just remove all of the consequences away from this relationship and then obviously I'm going to say at that point if you're saying and also the the perverse intentions so it's like we've removed the 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 the, the troubles or the irrational intentionality we've removed the um the the negative consequences like well yeah you've removed like everything that would be necessary to make sh make a moral judgment there to say that it was wrong but i don't believe that exists so it's like well hypothetically yeah in this absolutely impossible case like sure but like that doesn't exist like <laughs> so I don't think Oedipus. I don't think Oedipus was wrong for having sex with his mother because you can't blame Oedipus, like for like he didn't know that he was having sex with his mother. Um, can you say that the sexual act, if he was to perpetuate that onwards, like after he knows that it's his mother, uh, yeah, because he'd be risking the harm to the child, and it would also be, and it was clearly psychologically harmful to him. He gouged his own eyes out. So, uh, like, I mean, come on, man. <laughs> like, 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 <laughs>
It's not that the incest is okay if the parties are ignorant. I mean that the ignorance essentially rem the ignorance implies a innocence in terms of intention and intentionality. Um, and then if there's no negative consequences, if there's not going to be um, any sort of malformed births which are going to frustrate the ends of another, I, I couldn't get. I couldn't care. I, we're talking about is the same sort of relationship between any other members of the species. Yeah, you are distracting us. I need to get back to this. Okay. This is because evil by nature is a privation of being or a lack of what ought to be. And what ought to be is discerned, as has been shown, precisely through reason. Therefore, deductively, one can arrive at the conclusion that any rational agent who engages in a sexual act produced from the deliberation of the will of that rational agent, which excludes one of these three aspects of sexuality from the sexual act itself, participates in an ontological evil and acts immorally. Now, having said this, there are, are a plethora of objections one could raise against the argument presented. Uh, for example, one could say uh, they could point to the conjugal relations of a couple that is infertile, for example. Um, as it, this is, would be an example of non-procreative sexual activity that is considered even by the Catholic Church to be morally fine. Um, to this point, I think a concession has to be made of sorts. It is true that the activity between an infertile heterosexual couple is non-procreative. However, a crucial distinction has to be made here. Scholastic philosophy distinguishes between that which is per se and that which is per accident. Per se refers to that which is the way it is in principle. That is, of or relating to the definition. Yeah, but the, 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 the sterile act is in principle necessarily going to never, never actually lead to reproduction, just as the homosexual act would. Definition or nature of a thing. Per accidents... This refers but I don't know say why we wouldn't say that the homosexual act wouldn't be an accident. Like you're implying that the, like, or the, rather the homosexuality of the subjects wouldn't be a, an accident. Yeah, but the homosexuality is an accident, Maximo. It's not like the woke up and we're like, I'm gay now. Like I've just decided women aren't doing it for us, right? But we can't, it can't be by nature maximal because the nature of homosexuality has been derived from the sexual dimorphism, which is essentially heterosexual. So if we're saying man by nature is heterosexual, then a man being or man or woman being homosexual would be an accident. Like that's kind of built in. Like you can't have your cake and eat it too. It's either an accident of nature, just like sterility, or it's not, right? is to that which is posterior to the definition or nature of the thing, but is nevertheless existent, albeit merely as a quality or as a non-essential characteristic. Take, for example, a square. And also, we can even imagine, like, we can say in principle, um, for example, uh, uh, post-menopausal sex would clearly be wrong in itself, yeah? A square, by definition, per se, has four sides. I am not confused yet. I think you're all confused. I'm right. That is essential to its immutable definition. To Stop booing me. I am right. Nature. However, squares differ in their manifestations. One square may be, it may have an X drawn through it, uh, for example, but that does not affect its nature as a square since it retains its being a shape with four sides. The X drawn through the square is merely an attribute per accident of this particular square, but it does not alter the essence of what the square is in principle per se. Similarly, the non-procreative relations between two members of the uh, same sex and between a man and a woman who together constitute an inferno couple differ along these same categories. Homosexual relations, just to use an example, are not merely incidentally non-procreative, they are essentially non-procreative, as they are merely mutually masturbatory. Such sexual acts, by their nature, have of themselves absolute- Like, you know what I hate about this? I don't understand what wouldn't be- like, I, 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 I really can't understand how a couple which is necessarily sterile Right, let's say the woman's had a hysterectomy. She is definitely not going to reproduce. She has no ovaries, right? How is that any different? I just, I just do not understand. Like, are you saying they're trying despite having over, have, her having no ovaries to reproduce? And that's what justifies this? Are we really going to say that? Are we saying that actually they are, they are attempting to reproduce despite her lack of ovaries are we are we really fucking lying here like
like I understand what he's saying in terms of like per accidents and in principle, like this is an accident of existence such that it doesn't define the like the actual essence of the thing, right? But then homosexuality, as we've already mentioned, doesn't define the sexual characteristics of a being. Um, so I don't see what the difference is. Yeah, but the very nature of you being fucking sterile will mean you not have a baby either. Like, I don't, I, I don't, I don't understand. Like you're saying, like, because they're two men, by nature, they definitely won't, they definitely won't have a child. Yeah, but by the nature of her not having fucking ovaries, you're not going to have a child either, right? If you have no fucking, te like, if the man, it has no sperm, right, produces fucking zero sperm, right, unless God himself intervenes, right, and manifests a child within her, they're not having a child, right? Like, this is... Being a man isn't an accident, but being homosexual would be an accident in this respect because it's a psychological disposition, right? Such that they can only have a loving relationship with another man. So, like, if you're saying the natural... Like, if we're going to say that heterosexuality defines the natural relation between man and woman, and then homosexuality is defined by a frustration of that natural relation. Like, I just... Like, what's the difference? They're both accidents. Like, I don't... How would you manage to say that they're not? Okay, let's imagine, let's even remove it from sterility. Let's say it's a choice, right? Two people have HIV, right? They choose not to, they're in a loving relationship. They met each other through a HIV corp group, right? Like, that's how, they, that's how they met. They both got HIV, not even from, like, sexual immorality, right? They got it by an accident of being essentially poisoned with HIV from blood transfusions or some shit. It was a horrific accident. They've been paid millions, and now they've went to a corp group and they've met each other, they've fallen in love, and they decide to get married. Should they be abstinent? Like, are we going to say that they necessarily have to be abstinent? Let's say they can't reproduce, right? Or that they, uh... But why is the act being scrutinized? The act being is being scrutinized because it's saying that it leads to something unethical, immoral, when the only thing that it's leading to is sexual pleasure, but in the right setting, sexual pleasure doesn't seem to be wrong. So if we're saying sexual pleasure in the right setting isn't wrong, then we'll have to say that it's not the right setting. Why is it not the right setting? Because there's no child. If you're saying there's no, because it can't reproduce, then I don't see what the difference is. It just seems to be cope. I think you're all coping. That's what I think. I think this is cope. Isn't that bad faith? Well, I can't think... Look, oh, may, okay, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I, I shouldn't say that. Maybe I don't think you're coping in the sense that I just I just can't. Maybe I lack the the perception to 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 understand the fundamental difference here. If the reason that they can't have a loving heterosexual relationship isn't their choice, right? Such that it defines the characteristic of their being, and the act of sex can be done for reasons other than reproduction even if it is necessarily defined in relation to reproduction, but then I would say that in general, reproduction is defined in relation to pleasure, such that you can't remove pleasure from human existence and that to do so would be unintelligible. Um, then what we have is essentially people can have sex for reasons other than reproduction. If people can have sex for other reasons than reproduction, it simply has to be done in the right setting in which they will each other's good. So, like, why do we have to have it so that there has to be a child there? It just seems like, like, I, 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 like, like, oh, yeah, like, okay, but it's defined in relation of, of, of a reproductive act. I don't disagree. Sex is definitely an end 
one end of like sorry reproduction is definitely one end of sex to the point in which sex itself relies upon the reproductive process but in general the reproductive process relies upon essentially uh, a self-recognition and a mutual recognition and enjoyment of oneself right that's the foundations of all reality such that desire that it's the de desire for self-actualization which is tied to the enjoyment of oneself so if enjoyment is a necessary prerequisite for all epistemology and metaphysics and so all specific um ontological realities are downstream from that and we can say okay reproduction has its place within the flourishing of the species fair enough it doesn't define the good of the species and also the act of sex can be good in relation to other goods of the for the species like i don't see i don't see how we're getting like like can you can someone explain to me why we're getting to the point of So you're saying so so in general you're saying that it can't be good without openness to reproduction. In which case the sterile couple shouldn't be having sex. Right? They just shouldn't be. You're telling me that the only way they're enjoying sex or should be able to enjoy sex is they're hoping for divine intervention. I think by saying that pleasure is only intelligible by the act, you're saying that pleasure is only intelligible by the being, right? But being itself isn't a good. It's how we understand nature itself. You're placing pleasure as some sort of secondary good and not a good in itself. Uh, I mean, it's not the entirety of good, but it is a good in itself. Like, essentially, I would say a good in itself is the unity of the pre pleasure principle and the moral law. That is the flourishing of, of, one's exist of one's experience, right? We can go back a minute. Okay. We'll go from, like, yeah. There's further manifestations. One square may be, it may have an X drawn through it, uh, for example, but that does not affect its nature as a square, since it retains its being a shape with four sides. The X drawn through the square is merely an attribute for accidents of this particular square, but it does not alter the essence of what the square is in principle, per se. Similarly, the non-procreative relations between two members of the uh, same sex and between a man and a woman who together constitute an infertile couple differ along these same categories. Homosexual relations, just to use an example, are not merely incidentally non-procreative, they are essentially non-procreative, as they are merely mutually respiratory. Such sexual acts, by their nature, have of themselves absolutely zero relation whatsoever to the procreative power inherent in the nature of sexuality itself, except by virtue of the fact that they are precisely deviations. Yes, I mean, I agree with that, but I also don't think that reproduction defines our experience, right? It gets its good from human life, not the other way around, right? It's good to reproduce because it's good to live as a human, not it's good to reproduce and that's why it's good to be a human right that's the difference i'm not even saying reproduction doesn't define sex i do think reproduction is a not a, a necessary component for sexual dimorphism right sexual dimorphism implies a reproductive act like sex itself like like what it means for is sexual reproduction i get it but the only reason sex exists and the only reason that any of these specific ontological realities exist is directly tied to an enjoyment of oneself and the in the conditions of one's being like such that the pleasure principle like like if you try and divorce one's desire one's pleasure and the enjoyment of experience away from reality you will end up with an ontological negation of truth you cannot have truth without pleasure Right? If you do think that, like, I'm, I'm, I'm being very fucking clear here. You cannot have truth without pleasure.
from the true nature of sexuality as defined and argued for previously. Conversely, infertile couples, when they have... Like, what he's wanting to say is that a, a, a purely masturbator masturbatory blah, 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 act would be wrong. That's what he's trying to say. Which, in some respects, I could say would be wrong if it's subjectifying, if it doesn't lead to the proper recognition of oneself. That would be why it's wrong. It's not wrong because it's frustrating your sexual ends. That's just fucking twisted. Gay sex isn't masturbation, man. Masturbation isn't defined by whether you're having a fucking child or not. That's weird. Like, that's not how that works, right? Like, like, are you saying that if you weren't trying to reproduce while you're having sex, you're not able to recognize the other? Because I do not disagree. Like, it's about love, man. Like the intimacy in in the in the sexual act is not defined by the child; it defines the child. Relations are not engaging in an act that is, in principle, not procreative. Christianity in Christianity, creation is good, but not a good in itself. It's good in the sense that it is one; it's a reflection of God's goodness, and it's good in relation to the flourishing of the species essence. There's no reason to say that in Christianity. The oh, right, you're you're actually replying to the demiurge. Okay, yeah, I agree. For the object of their action is sexual intercourse between a man and a woman. That act, in principle, is always pro- I'm not taking love as purely uh, a hedonic calculus. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that love is actually tied to mutual relation of pleasure, such that pleasure and mutual recognition together means like a moral law, and pleasure forms the basis of all ontology, not some sort of, let's say, like abstract- um, or like, I, I just, I, I doubt you could even understand and grasp an essence without it. It is the, it is the unity of the species in terms of a mutually good will towards the species, which by the way, does include reproduction as a good, which I'm not saying it's not. It definitely is. It's one of the goods of the species, but it doesn't define the good of the species. PP, how do you love someone by having sex with them? I'm assuming that's sex with them, not send with them. You try to essentially fulfill their experience such that they feel loved, that they feel uh, recognized, considered, that their desires are being satisfied, but also uh, being resisted to the appropriate level. Like... Hegel has a whole point upon on how love is manifest metaphysically and it's a relationship between recognition such that it is the constant perpetuation of a desire and its and its satisfaction indefinitely um such that it it doesn't essentially form an abstract um unrelated um like uh object in which it, it it's constantly perpetuated but it is mediated and controlled but yet satisfied but there's are, are you telling me that like so you're saying that there is something that is wrong with wanting to have sex for pleasure that it's unnatural to have the desire for sex without pleasure Sex, uh, sex for pleasure. Is that what you're saying? I think you're absolutely wrong. I think that the like, why would why would you define your relationship with the other and your relationship to enjoy each other's company merely by the procreative act? It's like okay, yes, it's important, and it's like, look, like, I like, like look. My my desire for pizza isn't defined by it it's necessarily tied to my need for sustenance, but it isn't defined by my need for certain vitamins. Right? Like Oh, that's a fancy name. I've never seen that. 
Is that like if you're a how come you've got that cool name thing? Uh the cursed judge. Is that like if you're like a premium member or something? I'm confused about the appeal to naturality when many parts of society from coffee uh coffee to art and taking aspects of our minds not specifically designed for that, exploiting it for other purposes. I mean, I agree. I mean it, it's not even an exploitation, is it? Like it's a fulfillment. It's like, are you not like like, the needs are fulfilled in the wants as much as, like, the, the want itself and the need are, are mutually unified. So it's, it's, it's the experience of self. It's the enjoyment of self. Like, you're, you're taking away flourishing from, like, to the point in which it's just some sort of abstract, unhappy consciousness. Like, I don't, I don't know. It's just, like, just existence. It's going to end up in some sort of foul utilitarianism creative because the nature of sexual intercourse between a man and a woman taken in the abstract independent of particular circumstance by nature tends toward the production and ultimately the bearing and rearing of children what prevents this from taking place is not the object of the act itself but some condition extrinsic to the matter of the act itself which per accident renders the finality of the act unable to be realized homosexual relations simply inhabit an entirely different category altogether so the objection holds no water Secondly, one may object that there are really no grounds to insist that every act must keep intact. I mean, not really, it doesn't, but okay. Both the subordinate end and the primary end. In other words, why is it necessary that the unitive aspect of sexuality must always and everywhere be united uh, to the procreative end? In every instantiation of a properly sexual act, that is, acts that are derivative from the organs of generation. Now, to this, it should be said that the distinction between unitive and procreative is not a distinction that can be thoroughly abstracted from one another and made intelligible in and of themselves. They're inextricably linked together. One cannot be understood without reference to the other. The unitive aspect of sex of itself is ordered. That's ridiculous. Of course, unity can be understood in, outside of sex. Like, like, are you saying that the only way that. I mean, like, the unit of act isn't defined by the relationship between man and woman. Like, and even if you were to say that, like, like if anything, I'd say it's the, it's the point of psychological recognition which makes these acts intelligible in the first place as to why we'd be motivated to do it. Like, it... it toward the procreate, since the unit is made intelligible through the mode of the sexual organs, which of themselves, principally, is ordered toward... The it feels like uh, this is what I think. I think that we are seeing an ontology which is removing the agent from it. We are seeing an ontology which removes any consideration as to the to the actual experiences and the lived experiences of the agent from reality, and that makes me think that it's an intelligible nonsense, such that we end up with a kind of empiricism. And I'm gonna be like, okay, I, I don't, I don't care. I don't know how how are you even deriving the truth of this, like even metaphysically, like. The way in which we derive this is based around a phenomenal experience, right? Like, and this is, I think, why Hegel is superior to the pre-Kantian pre Aristotelians. The procreation, bearing, and rearing of children. Furthermore, pleasure does not exist in a vacuum. Uh, pleasure of itself is common to many appetites of human nature. It is defined as this type of pleasure or that type of pleasure uh, through the type of faculty it adheres in, which delimits it as... Uh, sexual pleasure, for example. But the faculties themselves are defined very much in relation to pleasure. So it's not like it's a one-way street. The faculties are defined in relation to pleasure and the goods that it can bring around for the species. Not just like this sort of abstract... Like, otherwise, you're going to say that it's... You're going to have to define reality in such a way as that you can remove a ple uh, the, the component of pleasure and say it's unintelligible. I don't think you can do that. And... So therefore, the pleasure and unitive connectivity between the two engaging in these activities are understood in and through the faculty from which they are derived, i.e. the reproductive faculty, which is itself the ontological basis of the second precept of the natural law. Similarly, it is impossible to fully abstract the procreative end from the unitive end as it relates to human beings. Human beings are not animals with the ability to reason super added to it. They are of themselves rational animals. This distinction between rationality and animality is one that is logical, not real in the sense that uh, one can distinguish one from the other in extramental reality when they are united together in one substance. Since the unitive aspect of human sexuality flows from reason, since it is through reason that the virtue of friendship is made. 
But that's the whole point, that all of this ontology flows from reason, not from uh, a, a, a sort of abstract principality which we then derive. It's, it's in relation to the lived experiences and expression of a reason which we are continually discovering, not a sort of given naive realism where we can perceive um, a, perceive the good with, or perceive the truth without pleasure and without an experience of goodness. Like, it seems like we're, we're going to end up with a, like, in my, from what I'm understanding, they're going to end up with a agent relation, agent object separation, which is going to essentially affirm the human position he was rejecting in the first place. You're going to end up with essentially a pre Kantian realism and it falls apart possible the procreative faculty has to be understood through the mode of rational beings which demand a certain friendship necessary to stay together for life and actually bear and rear the child that may indeed be brought about as a result of conjugal relations hence it is also possible to fully abstract the procreative aspect of, of human sexuality apart from the unitive without facing profound absurdity it is metaphysically impossible and reductive to absurdity to separate these two aspects of human sexuality in principle for in separation from one another each amount to something entirely unintelligible and hence irrational which is precisely what happens in every instance of homosexual acts sodomitical acts uh contraceptive acts masturbatory acts since of themselves they're unable to tend toward well i disagree with that very much so i think contraceptive homosexuality and um and uh Hell, I think like, you could you could probably make an argument for anal, I guess. I, I think it's probably less justified, but, you know, yeah, maybe. Maybe you could make an argument for anal, I'm not sure. <laughs> like, Both of these aspects properly understood. Therefore, these activities, since they, are, they can in no way be ordered toward the procreation and education of children as generative of these activities, and indeed they cannot even be said to be authentically unitive, because, as I said... The unitive is inextricably linked to the procreative, which informs the way in which the unitive is understood. Uh, since these activities cannot fulfill any of this, then they cannot be reconciled with what the moral law demands of human beings as regard the second precept of the natural law. That being said, moral fault is only present in he who, through the deliberation of the will, chooses to participate in an ontological evil, such as this. Those who experience deep-seated tendencies that are ordered toward ontological evils and yet in no way choose to participate in those ontological evils by way of their will cannot be said to be guilty of uh, a sin or an evil deed such as this, or a need of any sin. Nevertheless, given what has been said, it must be maintained that these activities, these deviations from the moral law, in the order of deliberated human acts, since they are in every case generative of an ontological evil as has been shown, cannot under any circumstances, be justified as morally licit. Therefore, it cannot be rationally avoided on pain of absurdity that fat truly is degeneracy. Stop being so nice. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to say that fap isn't good. Like, I think that there's a bad make a very big distinction between masturbation and a loving sexual encounter. Um, same relation that I would I would say that like promiscuity is worse than fapping in that respect though as well because then you're using someone as an object uh immediate object for your satisfaction and then that's uh masturbatory maspito if you want want to say it that way it's uh, an objectifying relationship um uh, i disagree i'm pretty sure that like didn't 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 irenaeus take the gnostics apart uh in terms of uh, the scripture um Okay, so that was that was something. Like very much for the fact that we actually believe that the the continued existence and procreation of the species, and that's why this video is going on right now, can be a good thing. Um, where it wouldn't be a good thing for Gnostics. Okay, so now we're gonna have um, Mario join, and Mario is gonna say that I'm wrong about gay sex. My, the thing is, right, like, look, I get, like, I get you guys are kind of invested in this, but, like, 
I can't make I can't keep making content on gay sex, right? There's there's loads of reasons why I just can't keep making content on gay sex. Okay. And I and like I just can't. Right? I'm one, I do believe that it's defensible, but I I can't just be the guy that continually argues every stream that homosexual sex and homosexual acts can be justified in certain circumstances, right? That's just like like, that's not the, like, it's not, it's just not a really, like, it's not an entire brand, man. Like, I need to do other things. <laughs> oh, Mario, hello. Oh, hey, man. How are you doing? How are you doing? I'm doing good. So I'm wrong yeah, how are you? about homosexual sex. <laughs> um... Are you wrong? I mean, I do think so, but I think the lar the larger thing is I don't see your objection. I guess you might say I don't. Uh, I, I, I don't see exactly how your objection is formulating against so, the natural law. Yeah, so, so. I'm not arguing against natural law. Um, I'm arguing against the way in which we're perceiving natural law. Wait, oh, sorry, could you say that again? The law per se. I'm arguing against this consideration of natural law through naive realism. Okay. Well, okay, first thing I'd want to know is what do you mean by naive realism? So, um, essentially a non-agent related relationship to reality in the, say, that like a uh, direct awareness or direct empiricism of reality, non-mediated relation of reality. You could think of it like that. Okay, well... You said non-agent related. Well, first of all, I do defend the theory of direct acquaintance. Yeah. But I don't think that implies that the agent is not participating in its knowledge. Um, it implies that the sort of like, so I think that the, 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 it's whether the, the, so I think that both the Hegelians and the Thomists are going to say that there are real universals from which we are acknowledging at the point in which we engage with reality. It's how you give an account for those universals and how you uh, manage to essentially relate your the ideas in your mind and correspond them to reality. Now, Hegel's going to say well, that hold there on. is... I, I'm not a naive realist in that definition, though, because I do not say that there is no active part of the agent intellect. Right, I mean there, that the active part of the, of the intellect is called the agent intellect in Aquinas. So there is an active part to knowing, right? Meaning, it's not merely I'm passively gaining information, right? Mm -hmm. That I mean, that that really would be like a kind of Lockean. But it's how you gain the information, right? Position. Like so, it's and it's it's so like. Inside mass just work out what I'm gonna do at the end of the day. Okay, I'll probably have to I'll kill that. Kill that. And there we go. Yeah, so the I mean sure, like in the sense that reflection is necessarily required so that you can perceive um the universality through the sort of immediate relation that you have to reality, which is essentially like through, um, like through the immediacy of, uh, of perception, you can gain, and, and upon reflection, you can gain a better and greater understanding, which is more universal and causative, um, than the, uh, mere sort of just, you perceive it and then you perceive the universal, but the way in which you perceive the universal, it's how do you give an account for how you gain knowledge of reality and how reality is structured, right? So, like, in the same sense that, one second, that David Hume is... Well, in my opinion, the problem with David Hume is it's twofold. He believes in associationism and then his arguments are self-defeating. Um, I think that David Hume's arguments are self-defeating as well, but I actually think that Kant uh, made uh, explain the reasons why. Um, and so, tied... the transcendental aesthetic, I think, he explained why. I don't know mm -hmm. about 
the rest of his books. <laughs> well, specifically the transcendental aesthetic, but uh, you know, as a Hegelian, I don't think there's anything else I really need from that because it just shows that the the experience of the phenomena pre-exists the um, the uh, the the way in which you would understand the sort of concrete nature of objects, right? Um, and what Hegel's going to say is that the only way that that functions is in relation to a natural drive to obtain one's ends, which is made intelligible by pleasure, but the pleasure itself would be one-sided without a moral mediation with other individuals. So we have a moral law and we have a pleasure principle. And those two together, when taken completely, form the basis of uh, how we would obtain truth. Now, if that's the case, then pleasure and um, satisfaction, enjoyment is well, integral what's the to justification human... for the pleasure pr- for the pleasure principle i'd like to understand why you'd have a pleasure principle in the same way that your desires like in the se- in the sense that it has to be um i think i've just lost that your desires that your first order desires that the satisfaction of your first order desires or your um desire towards unless you think that you can desire other things than pleasure like do you think that we desire something other than pleasure um, such that pleasure can be totally absent from what we desire. I mean, the way I would state is that pleasurable, like the, the pleasurable thing that's happening to me now, like for example, when I take heroin, right? Um, that's, that's what's in my mind's focus at the time, right? Clearly the act is bad. Mm-hmm. Now what I would say is the pleasure can only be understood in terms of a certain good. In, in terms of moral actions, uh, for example, like the pleasure in sex, I would say, is only really intelligible by the fact that um, those things are made for procreation. That, that, that'd be my view. Okay, so let's, uh, let's see if I can reiterate that back. Um, so you're saying the pleasure itself is uh, made intelligible by... Uh, it's relation to the act, right? Yeah, right. So take the example of eating food, mm-hmm. right? Um, I don't eat food because it's pleasurable, right? Or sorry, that might be what's psychologically motivating me, right? The good that's derived from eating food is not the pleasure. It's the nutrition that's derived, right? But that's I, what's I disa- uh, I about dis- it. I disagree. Like, I don't think that the good is understandable without the pleasure like such that the animal uh the state of enjoyment and satisfaction is what makes intelligible the fulfillment of drive such that it is the state of enjoyment okay, well hold on you, you said you said fulfillment but fulfillment inc- implies like an objective teleology i believe in an right? objective it, it, teleology. It, 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 well i believe i know, in an I know but like what i'm saying is that like when you say something is fulfilled you're saying some end is fulfilled mm-hmm. right Meaning the fulfillment is only intelligible by the end that's being achieved. Mm-hmm. And that end, I think, implies a relationship with one's own experience. Uh, so it is the move towards an experience. No, because of I think whether or not we are experiencing something as good, it's still objectively good in itself. I don't know what you mean. When you say objectively good in itself, like if that doesn't include the... Like the good of humanity is defined by the experience of the members of the species. Um, it's not defined by a relationship to an object from which humanity could essentially be like you could imagine humanity be suffering, but not perpetuating a good, but be petu- perpetuating a good. I don't think that me- makes sense. Um, no, because you know, let's take the example. Like I've I've heard you kind of say that. Um... That, uh, you know, we, we shouldn't procreate if, like, the person's, like, the person will suffer, I, right? I think before we're going to It's important to be kind of can, clear, can, huh? Before we go to specific examples, I think the problem is metaphysical, such that I would say that the object is defined directly in relation to the subject, since the meaning of the object is derived phenomenally, such that the categorical relation between subject and object is what we are talking about. And so, like, my relationship between objectivity defines my subjectivity and the object is defined by my subjectivity right so when i observe even 
like well, when I observe anything and I understand, I understand what I'm doing is I'm actually projecting my subjectivity up upon it. Right. Um, I'm, I do not believe that. Like, do, do you believe what Aristotle said in the physics, which is that light is intelligible in itself? Um, that light is intelligible in itself, not just in the sense that it makes um, objects uh, perceivable. Yeah, sorry, um, sorry, I meant color. Color, sorry. Is color not intelligible in itself? color intelligible in itself um what do you mean like without reference yeah, is it only intelligible because we see it is that the only reason why it's intelligible um i think that what we talk about as being color is only intelligible when we take into consideration it's being perceived like i don't believe that there is a I, I don't believe in a reality that is not perceived um but I, you don't I, believe I, in a reality that's not perceived? No, not at all. So you're a kind of Berkeleyan idealist in that sense? No, I'm a Hegelian, but like, I would say that the, when we talk about... Well, I think Hegel denies the, the proposition that to be is to be perceived, right? What he denies is that to be is to be perceived in, in the Berkeleyan sense. Yeah, sure, but like he doesn't say that you could have an object without a subject absolutely, such that the truth of the subject isn't defined within the object so like he's what he's rejecting is subjective idealism so like he's not saying color is defined by the subject's relation to it but color is defined within the relationship between object and subject absolutely because that's what the absolute is which defines everything um so i thought the absolute was beyond subject and object the absolute is the sublation of subject and object which makes them possible yeah yeah, yeah, it's, it's a sublation, so it has to be beyond them, right? It determines them. It determines that relation. It determines the... the um, but the, the, the going beyond is the subject finding itself within the object uh, in the first place, such that it forms the truth of the self, which is why Hegel's going to say that ultimately... So the, then it doesn't seem like, like to be is to be perceived in any sense of the to word, be is right? to, be, to be is to experience for Hegel. It's, that's essentially what he's going to affirm in the end. Interesting. You think Hegel says to be is to be experienced. I don't think that. To I think Hegel is to, thinks to be is to be thought. Well, yes, but only so far as the thought is the experience. Like he is not gonna do he's not gonna talk about thought in a sort of um in a sort of abstract way that doesn't have a phenomenal self relation. Right? He's gonna say that it's phenomenal, like or or even um experiential. Uh he's he's gonna say it's a self relation. And he's, to, I mean, specifically, what he's going to say is actually to be is to, uh, to have a oneness between the contents of the thought and the thinking, such that the thinking of oneself is unified with the with the thought of oneself. So it's the, uh, and this is the point of absolute knowing. So where it is an immediate, mediated relation between oneself uh, and the. But, but it seems like having. Hegel still wants to say he wants to agree with Aristotle and say that color is, that color is objectively knowable in itself. Without um, me there. Uh, nothing is objectively knowable without the, the animal. Like, the, the object is defined in relation to the animal, and the subject is defined in relation to the object. Well, actually, the subject is defined in its relationship to itself, which is the fundamental relation to re of reality. So, like... So, so then how, do, how does the potential intellect come into conformity with the object, then? Um... Well, the object, like when you say... Because Hegel does think that. Hegel does think the intellect conforms to the object. Um, only so far as that the, the, uh, the intellect is coming to, recon coming to reconcile itself with itself. And that's what it forms a coherence. This is why Hegel isn't just a correspondence theorist. He's a coherentist. And he's saying that there is a rational structuring of... Such that when I make... When I form the object through my, form, my way of categorizing... I can do it incorrectly or correctly. And then through my relationship with others, I test my categories and against reality and can perceive th that irrationality, which uh, I can then seek to correct. Um, yeah, yeah, but I don't want to like, I don't want to like get into the fundamental, on I think there's no point of getting to the fundamental ontology, right? I mean, the, the point is, right, Hegel in generally, in general, like believes in this kind of he believes natural in law. 
he, yeah, he believes in he believes in, in natural objects. law, but the way in which he perceives nature is to unite nature with our experience. Like, so for example, when he talks about the relationship, like that nature produces consciousness in order to express its reasons, such that the reasons of consciousness, such that consciousness was not only a necessary prerequisite, but a, a an immediate necessity. It, it forms the basis of reality, like it's retrocausative, right? Such that like conscious experience is the bedrock of reality. He's not going to talk about some sort of like, um, sort of objective material realm where the, cause he's going to say that the truth of the material is derived from its relation to consciousness. And he's going to sit and he's going to affirm what Shellen says, which is a, it's a petrified intelligence. So there is a, there is an aspect to ourselves that's a petrified intelligence. Now that's a specific nature like you know that defines the human condition yeah, but, but right? then you, but then as you like you just kind of refute it yourself because hegel also thinks that's true about the objects uh yes but not in the sense that we gain it immediately you know so like so like the way in which we're perceiving objects so the phenomena and its relation Again, to the I, object I, I don't want to go into like this immediacy stuff i just want to know whether or not you know that I mean, thing that's black right there mm -hmm. right there's like in front of me there there's a suitcase that's black right now mm -hmm. Right. If I'm gone, if there's no people around, right, is it intelligible in itself? Yes, because mind still exists, because mind is in direct relation to God. Okay, but I, I'm just talking about ourselves right now, right? Let's let's not talk about God. I don't that's not well, right. we're we're Hegel, oh. because the end is going to be essentially our unity with the divine, such that it is essentially No, no, but you know that that's kind of the end of natural law too but like we're just we're just talking about natural law right now right i mean but you could be a secularist in natural law right so i know, guess kind I, of I mean i'm not sure i'm not sure whether that would make sense like to be honest like the teleology in hegel is totally that, that derives the meaning of being is in relation to the end of consciousness so like in the like when you're saying like okay we all disappear yeah we do uh but as long as there's something there's consciousness but that's so it's like like there is the act of there is the specific like you could imagine this even in terms of like how we even understand color right such that there is the specific frequencies in reality hegel's not going to say that the way that light, light bounces off an object defines our relationship to color like that's what color is color is defined in the relationship to the animal so like he's not going to say that the object doesn't reflect light in a certain way sure if there's no animals about and you know they color, you know, frequencies and uh, well, light bounces off objects. And, you know, if there was an animal to perceive it or if there was a, a detector to detect it, it would actually be there. It's not going to be like Barclay, which is like, it simply doesn't exist. But he's going to say that that relation is one sided, which is why nature necessarily has to produce a conscious being in order to perceive itself. So, like, he's not, he's going to say that, like, in order to make intelligible the object, such that the subject comes about, you have to imply that there is an immediate necessity in nature for the subject to exist in order for nature to perceive itself and its truth be to be real. So the truth of color isn't necessarily just the frequencies of light that it's actually in its perception and the frequencies of light, such that it is a manifestation of a subject object relationship. Okay. But, but PB, okay. Just, okay. If you define it as the, the being able to perceive the light in a certain frequency, whatever, right. We have to admit that's objectively there, whether or not we are here. Yeah, there's the, but, the, but it's one sided. Have. Yeah, but it's one sided. That's like Hegel's going to say it doesn't express the truth of the the object. Like it, it, it's it's not the whole truth. I think Hegel's going to say that in relation to God, but he's not going to say that in relation to us, which is he's, what I care about right now. He's right? going to say that in relation that's, to everything. He's going to say that's why we came about. I know that's why he's going to say that, but I, again, I just want to pay attention to right now. We're here, right? Again, let's. Forget okay. about the the high food metaphysics. We have our disagreements, right? But um, I, the only again, reason right, I'm bringing this up, a... the only reason I'm bringing this up, is because Hegel is going to see the truth as necessarily tied to the truth of the subjectivity, not just objectivity, right? So if you, if you were to say like there is an object of human nature, yes, but Hegel's also going to say that the experience of the subject defines just as much what it means to be human as that objective human nature, such that, in fact, the subjectivity is given precedent, pref, uh, precedence to, to the objectivity. 
because subjectivity itself. I mean, PP, I mean, this, like, this absolutely, like, I think this has nothing, like, I think we could, I think we could throw out this discussion and it wouldn't impact it at all. And here's why. Okay. Aquinas says something similar. He says um, that being as truth, right, which is a, which is not like a specific kind of being, it's a, it's a convertible with being, right? It's a transcendental. Um, he says um, truth is only in the intellect. That's what he says, right? So let's let's forget about that, right? What again? All that we're asking, or all that Aristotle's asking, is that this black suitcase in front of me right now is it intelligible in itself, and not merely intelligible because of me, right? That's all I care about. I don't I don't care about okay. if it's only intelligible because of God or because of some dialectical process in nature. Mm-hmm. All I'm talking about is me. But I, I I like I guess this is I guess this is kind of I don't know it's confusing it's like when you say it's intelligible in itself without you what do you mean like do you like what do you mean what is the truth of that such that you want to say like, I just mean that what you wh- are, whether or not I'm here needed. I could potentially come about and I could and that truth could potentially have me conform to it I mean That's all I mean sure. I would I would agree with that, um, right? Like like if I said that, but it's like, not an entirely like if I said con- the suitcase is white. That's wrong, right? No, but like yes, and Hegel's going to agree with that, such that you want like you want just able to manifest whatever the fuck you want in the object, right? There is a fittingness to yeah. the concept. Uh, mm-hmm. Sure, um, I don't think Hegel's going to say anything's wrong with that. Um, yeah, but, but it'd that, be that's wrong to say, yeah. But it, it'd be, but it's it's kind of like, and that's fine, and I agree with that. It's just that I think for the and 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 correct me if I'm wrong, for the position of natural law from your like for the direct acquaintance take to essentially hold, which is to say, and specifically for the for the point of, in terms of reproduction, that we could imagine an an object, an objective, um, ontological good, separate from the experience or the pleasure of lived lived individuals like the actual self experience right and hey I, I don't believe in that like i believe that it has the potential to evoke truth if okay my, my lived experience of that thing being black only happens because of the thing that thing wasn't there i wouldn't experience the thing as black right true true but it's you okay it's well that, that's also, all i was getting at with the pleasure the right. pleasure is only intelligible because there's an objective thing there no, that's like the wrong way around. Like that thing is only intelligible, intelligible just as much as the fact that you're trying to essentially create a, an experience of self, which is positive for Hegel, just as much like such that the like what makes like the subject. I understand that happens in like the dialectic as a whole, but I, I'm just asking I mean, just about in terms myself, of right? philo- philosophy of nature. Like it's it's like yeah, yeah. I I know that I know that happens as like a whole dialect, but like. And and I know you think nature's in dialectics and all that kind of yeah, stuff, but yeah, I'm I'm trying to push that aside right now because I'm just like, I don't know how we can like it's a massive metaphysical difference. Like I don't know how we could just put it aside. Like, uh, uh, it's, how can we just put it aside? I mean, for example, we would both agree that, and it's pretty much based on the same reasoning. You can't kill someone, right? And I don't have to discuss with you high fluent idealism, right? That's just not something I need to do. Yeah, but we'd say that the the metaphysical truth of that would be derived from a correct ontology, though, right? Like, so if like you could have like ontological differences, which downstream would lead to justifications of certain acts. Sure, right, and and I'm I'm willing to bet that like maybe maybe there's a problem for one of us somewhere down the road metaphysically, but like right now, I want to stick to the debate, which is about the gay act, right? Right. And and That's, and this is and this is there. so there isn't like here's the thing so this is where I, this is the reason I made it metaphysical in the first place I think and if I'm correct your position is that there is a morally object objective natural law which we should conform to right and um sure in the same way that I can't make this I can't make that suitcase black sorry I can't make that suitcase white because it's black right that's just what it and but what I think is, and I and I understand what you're saying there, and I think in in part I agree um, that mm-hmm. you can't control the truth maker. Like the truth is separate to you, what you want, right? 
yeah. but likewise i'm not going to say that the truth maker in this scenario is objective but absolute and that's going to cause the difference such that the moral law and the pleasure principle you're saying the moral law makes the pleasure principle intelligible when i'm saying that it's the that the moral law and the pleasure principle are mutually necessary for the intelligibility of flourishing so like one isn't one doesn't exist without the other um and that's like kind of the difference ontologically such that the truth maker is absolute for me so it's a relation of subject and object uh, and not uh, just an object the truth maker is not just an object there and you could see how like from that ontology we are going to derive an ethical difference that is going to be pretty pretty big such that mine is going I, I, to directly I don't buy that because a bunch of hegelians agree with my ethics right so i'm not saying that the dawn i'm I saying that me that. specifically from the stance that i'm taking um mm -hmm. i'm not saying that they don't agree with your conclusions they're going to disagree with your specific ontology right like the half do right like that's like they just half do like I, I don't make the rules right hegel's not a uh does not believe in direct acquaintance like whatsoever right like so right. so like there comes to a point in which that you know the, they can agree that there is a fittingness to the concept which goes beyond their caprice right but not beyond yeah, subjectivity. Yeah, but, but, but Pee -Pee, did you see how, like, I don't have to bring in, like, I know I know later down the line, right, I, like, I know if we want to sit down and have, like, a 10-hour discussion, right, it definitely, we could definitely go over these kinds of things, right? But, like, I don't see how, like, my theory of direct acquaintance, specifically in the way I want to argue it, will impact okay. this problem whatsoever. Well, we'll, we'll see. I just, okay. all I wanted to point I, out I was guess I'm, I'm trying not to skip ahead. a realist by your definition that's fine i, I guess i'm trying to skip ahead and yeah. be because what i'm what i'm and, and this is essentially why it's like i'm not trying to say that we're having a 10-hour discussion in, in fact that's what i'm trying to prevent i'm trying to prevent us having a discussion that is ultimately going to lead back to ontology and ontological differences because that's what i think is probably going to happen i think we're going to look at ethical introspection in which you're going to say and this is you can tell me if this prediction is adequate necessary so you're going to say that you can have through a form of direct acquaintance with the objectivity of humanity, you can derive in its entire the natural good for humanity. And that natural good is going to inform you on whether which behavior is good or bad, irrespective of the experiences, the lived experiences of humans, such that we can derive it through a form of object analysis. Is that correct? Um, no, because I think you're also directly acquainted with the fact and the conformity, right? So you're directly, you're directly acquainted with the fact, the conformity, and the thought, all in one acquaintance. Right, and um, so what, is, what, is that, what so does do that entail? See, that's not really useful because I think, you know, I, I have a pretty unique position in epistemology, right? That isn't the... You know, most people learn about direct acquaintance through Bertram Russell. I don't have Bertram Russell's theory of direct acquaintance, right? I don't believe that so you do. I believe me, I like, I, like, I have, I have respect for you. Um, you know, like, uh... oh, you know, there, there's no, there's kind of like no point in like doing because I'm not, I'm not going to try to make that argument. I'm not, I'm, not gonna I'm, go I'm, like, I'm only making a joke about Bertram it, Russell and see, not having respect for Bertram it, Russell. Sorry, I was. <laughs> no, but I, I'm just saying, like, if you, I, I'm not going to make the argument. Well, if you look, you'll just see, right? I, I, the only argument I'm going to make, and, and I'm not even going to make the argument against dialectics in this case. I don't. I don't think that that matters. All that matters is that you understand that that I can't make the suitcase black, and whether or not I'm here, the suitcase is black, and that's all I care about. You admitting, right? I don't care about the, the like big metaphysics behind that about why that is the case, right? Um. I'm just going to make the same argument I'm happy with sexuality. To, I'm, happy, and I'm happy to say, like, and this is, this is, this is, and it's going to be really, like, and I'm not being facetious. I'm not being a dickhead. I'm happy to say no, that the so. suit, the suit reflects light uh, in the same way whether you're here or not. But the truth of the suitcase being black is not there unless there's someone perceiving it. Okay, that's, that's fine, right? I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay. Yeah, I just, I just, 
want to understand that there are just some things out there with or without me perceiving it. Yes. Right. And then I, I can only come to know those things by perceiving the thing. Right. Yes. I'm not getting into it. Uh, don't worry. I'm not even a, like even a Kantian would admit this. Right. I mean, uh, yes. Just, uh, like, uh, I, yes. Like, yes. Yeah. I mean, the to the suitcase in order to be black. Actually, but yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you have to intuit the suitcase in order for it to be black, right? Um, so I'm going to say the same thing with, with pleasure. I'm going to say we have to intuit something in order for it to be pleasurable. Um, I mean... Yes, I suppose. I don't think I'd have a problem right. with that. Yeah. Okay. And then when, when we come to face with something, so to speak, right? Nothing like I can't make that thing pleasurable. Right. Um, like no. I understand there are subjective differences in pleasure. Right. But it that doesn't I mean, mean like, like, I mean, I, I can I like just psychologically just like you're talking about like, the put a sword through my hand at one point, have it be painful. And at another point, just randomly in my mind, go, ah, therefore. Sure. But I mean, um, what we're talking about is intuiting our own subjectivity. Like, yeah, yeah. That's like, okay, that's, that's all I care about for now, right? So all that matters is that when I, when I stab my hand, right, I can't just go from feeling pain to feeling pleasure or something like that. Yes, I would agree. Right. Now, even, even if someone says I can, right, they're going to, they're going to use, they're, they're going to say something like, well, I could, do some kind of science experiment for you to have that happen. Okay. But that requires a science experiment, right? I'm just talking about when you're yeah, just out no, here. I agree. I, 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 I okay. Agree. So you agree with that, right? Okay. So the pleasure requires the intuition, right? Okay, so I'm going to say again, that, that the pleasure in the sexual act, right? Is only made intelligible by the sexual act. Um, no, No. So I think that the pleasure, the specific kind of pleasure of the sexual act is made intelligible by the sexual act. Sure. Okay. Um, well, what, what do you mean by, why do you want to, why do you want to differentiate the specific pleasure I'm feeling in the sexual act? Because, it, because it's how we understand the sexual act in the first place. Right. So like for like, like for Hegel and like, obviously there is the sort of physical conditions in which I, Feel, let's say like the like the like the, the physical conditions in which like like you know like orgasm and stuff and that is is actually made mm. possible sure but only mm. so much as that is also in relation to an intuitive relation between subjects um like a psychological mm. relation between subjects um like a, a union between subjective subjects if you will um so there is the relationship between your your physicality your body your the way you interpret uh physical stimulus and okay. a psychological relationship with others um and yeah that's 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 i'm happy to say that's what would make the sexual act intelligible such that like for example the pleasure of a sexual act isn't derived simply from the physical experience but it's derived from also the psychological relation which makes intelligible the physical experience um and even the way okay, in but, which but you I, relate I, yeah, to your body i like body. that you differentiated those two things because like all, all that i want to argue about is the act yeah right? but I'm, i mean even the like what i'm really saying is that even when we when we differentiate them sure like we're saying that there is like there is a real body right like no doubt um mm -hmm. but how how we psychologically relate to our bodies and <laughs> even um what makes certain like you know mind body relationships possible is not defined merely in the object right like that's all i'm really trying to say there so like so for example like you know you could you could try to perform a sex act, sex act on yourself and feel no pleasure because your your head's in the wrong place uh from my perspective so even though that your body engages uh like you could for example, have a phys have all the physical prerequisites of orgasm, and you can see this uh, in terms of um, psychological issues in in t between sexual relations. Uh, and people actually go to therapists for this. Um, 
you see this in rape where they have like physical responses but no uh psychological uh experience of pleasure um such that the act like the pleasure like the 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 pleasure's not there but the response is um yeah so like i just don't want to make it so that you know like just like that's all i'm really trying to say mm. okay um okay but okay okay i like they used to differentiate the psychology from from the thing right and then it's fine that you say they're intertwined right but again all, all i really want to scrutinize is just the act right that that's all i want to scrutinize right, right? okay um, I, I mean for, for example i mean like we just have like we'd have some pretty big differences here like for example like you said like the i i heard you say this is something like like the the love of a homosexual relation right is what makes the sex justified right mm -hmm. i could admit they, they could have a love for each other right but the act itself i would say is not given in love Why? that's what i would say right i would say the act isn't given in love because it's a perverted act right but you, you see how that's the question right yeah so, that is the that is the question yeah like yeah right so so that's why i would say like we should we should just kind of avoid the psychology here because the psychology is kind of like the, the psychology relates to the question in that way in the way i just said in my example but i, I just right i mean that's i, I get but I, I just don't know how we could like the if if what defines the love the the love the not being a loving act is that it's perverted and if it was if so for example if you were to say that it was a loving act it wouldn't be perverted right and vice versa sorry wait could you say that again so if it's oh, not no, if it's not perverted it could be a loving act it's not perverted it could be a loving act um if it wasn't perverted yeah right Right. So, like, surely that's the point, and and because if we say that it it being a loving act, if you're saying if it was a loving act, would it be justified? If it was a loving act, yeah. Well, then I would say it'd be given in love, right? Yes, that's fine. It's, I'm I'm a hundred percent. But would it be justified then? Because obviously it would be giving in love, and it, it would it would be a it would be. Well, a, what do you mean it would be justified? Like it would be it would be um it wouldn't be sinful. If it was given in love, only if the act was objectively, like lovable, you might say something like that. Yeah, right. I get, I I, get, I know what you're saying. Like, and and I think that's this is why I think that it's going to lead to an ontological difference. But like, the so the point of it being perverted is defined in the fact that it is uh, objectively unlovable, so it can't be given in love, and so cannot be an act of love. Would you say that's right? Yeah, right. Yeah, I would say that's right. Which is going to, which is going to say that it is, it's going to relate directly to an ontology. Mm -hmm. Like, like I can't, I can't intend to stab someone, right? Lovingly. And yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, got, yeah. So, in what way is this objectively unloving, then? Or unlovable? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so now this is the question, right? Okay. Okay. So. What I would say is the okay. So, okay, would you agree with this? The organs themselves are made for reproduction. Um, like that's what the organs are for. I mean, in a secondary sense, not a, like. I, I mean, okay. I, I would say like so. For example, like yes, but I think it's also going to lead us to ask, what is the good of reproduction? Um, and it's not going to be a good in itself. That's fine, right? Okay, we, we can get to that question when we get there. But like, the point is, the, the organ itself is made intelligible mm -hmm. through sexual dimorphism and sexual reproduction. Yeah, yeah. Okay, would you would you agree with that then? Um, I think it certainly forms a, a, a the uh, a basis for it. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. That's okay. That's fine. Right. Okay. So so if the act is made intelligible by by its reproduction. Right. Then, then the argument here is something like. Well, this. I think um, it would be. I think it'd be more. It'd be better for me, in general, to express that the, re, the what I think is being expressed is that there is a a need for sexual reproduction of the species, not that reproduction is always a good. Um. 
Okay, well, okay, I'd, I'd like to scrut- okay, I'd, I'd like to, to scrutinize that a little bit. As in, like, uh, you know, draw a scalpel to that idea, okay? Would you, would you say that, um, if, if, I, if I gave birth to something, right, and I intended to give birth to it so that a mad scientist could kill it right when it comes out of the womb, right? Imagine, imagine we were that kind of scenario, right? Yes. That would be um, in fact, you can imagine here. everyone in the world is in that scenario. So it's right? Literally the sins of Sodom in some respects, right? We'll just go, just, you're just going to eat them, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, let's do that, right? You just eat them, right? Like, do you, like does that make the act of giving birth bad? Like, in my view, what's bad in that situation is my intent for giving birth, right? Um, like, so, so maybe my intent for or, you know, someone inseminating me, right? And then, uh, I'm not a woman, by the way. I know, that, that was <laughs> um, so trippy. I, I like, yeah, 100%, <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's getting God. clipped. That has to get clipped. Okay, God. continue. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, you know, maybe the act of insemination, right, that, that, that would be immoral in that case. And then maybe the act of killing the child immediately as it comes out of the womb is immoral. Yes. But that doesn't mean that the act of giving birth itself is immoral. Right? Um, not in itself, no. It doesn't follow. But this specific, like, but you could also say, like, for example, like, the good of reproduction is for the good of the species essence, which is defined by the lived experience of its members, such that the reason why it would be, you'd be justified or unjustified in the process of reprodu- of engaging in the deliberate process of reproduction would be in relation to the lived experiences of all of those members of the species who are going to be essentially affected by your decision right so so do you think this is like do you think this is true for like overpopulation yes maybe like just just a question okay so like you would say if like if there was overpopulation right um hey if, if there was overpopulation um you might you might not want to give birth something like that or it would be unjust you'd be you'd be immoral for unjust. for de- for okay. deliberately well, I, for, okay. for, I, I want to know what's unjust for, not in, that in the case, act though. of giving birth cuz I'll be that's kind of weird but in the uh mm-hmm. in the act of deliberate procreation okay so, okay so okay so 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 this is good right so you're not saying that the act of giving birth is immoral, right? We'd always say that's a good. Yeah, right? like, I, I think that like it's good like when children exist, that the children are a good in themselves, like they're an end in themselves, yeah. right? And because they're mm-hmm. an end in themselves, if, if it's derived against the end, if, if it's an, the, 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 if it's a, the, the act of reproducing is always a means to an end for the existence of the members of the species, which is a unified whole, and which is defined by the experience of the species and the, the, the flourishing of the species, such that if it frustrates that, mm. let's say it causes starvation, death, disease, whatever it may be, then it would be uh, unjustified. So, like, don't have incest kids, don't have disease-ridden kids, don't have... Like, so if you, if you perpetuate a kid who's going to di- suffer and die, you are doing wrong by that child and you are doing wrong against the species essence mm. of humanity. I, I'm interested, Are like, do, do you think... Uh, like, do you think abortion is wrong? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so like, even if an incel child, like, somehow I mean, was brought about, about, we both agree that's immoral. Yeah. Right? I mean, we're talking about a being which would be rather whether the act of incest would be justified. So, like, the deliberate procreative act. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the child. Like, the child is always an end. Uh, what we're talking no, I'm, about. I'm just like trying to. I'm just trying to get down in each example what what you think is good and what's not good. So. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so okay, in the act of in, like in the act of incest, you think the act is what's wrong, not the what's giving birth is wrong. Yeah, like obviously the child is never to blame for this. Like the child's not the right. child is not the child okay. is end is the font of moral value. In fact, okay, now now again, right? I, I, okay, so then okay, so now now I'm kind of clear about what's what's right and wrong in your view. Okay, so now isn't the sexual act only intelligible as you said by the fact that we give birth to a child? Which is uh, a good in itself. I mean, so sexual that's the end that's being achieved. 
it's not uh, like the the good in itself is the existence not the not the act of reproducing uh such that the act of reproducing can be unjust that's why well i i i know, I know you think that right but like i'm just asking right that it's like the, if it, if it's good if it's a good act if the act is good it's how we define it how do we good. understand the act to be good that's the that's the that's that's the the question well, i know i know but that, that's what i'm asking in, in the incestual question right in the incestual question the act is bad right? the act of procreation is bad right mm -hmm. because it produces a monster child let's say right? or it has the probability of producing a monster child right Mo um, monster child's a bit harsh man like okay you, you know what i mean like, yeah i know what you mean i mean like you know, deformities you know I mean. and suffering right like yeah 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 okay monster child so, catholic yeah <laughs> like, you know it's like and then it's like burn it burn, burn, burn the child uh -huh. but but again right you wouldn't say that when, when the child is born we should kill it because then the child is good in itself uh it's an end in itself yeah it's good in itself yeah yeah okay so so i agree some so i want to agree some procreative ba acts are bad right like incest for example right um, so I'm not here to argue that all procreative acts are bad. By the way, yeah, I I'm think, not I think that, great I think, at this. Let, let me just let me just because, uh, uh, let me just yeah. clarify. I think that, that there is a point in which that it might spark the difference. Do you think that ending a life, let's say a be, let's say an individual wanted to end a life um, through artificial means uh, in order to prevent um, suffering? Um, and let's say the suffering is unavoidable and necessarily, and they're necessarily going to die anyway. Like it's not something that can overcome or, you know, it's like not, not, nothing like that. It's something that is only like in terms of their lived experiences going to mean that like, like they can either stop living now or they can stop living in two extra days, let's say, but they'll also endure agonizing pain. Um, <clears throat> Is their existence in that agonizing pain a good in itself? Or is their it existence defined? is good, but I don't think the pain is good, right? Can, can we differentiate those two or no? You see, I don't think that this is the point. I don't think that you can define, like, unless you can define existence away from experience, I don't think it makes sense, right? Such that, like... I think they're really distinct. Like, you can really distinguish the existence from essence. Right, like the the manner of sorry, being follows prior to the manner of being. Um, like obviously, this can't be like a genuinely sharp distinction, right? Like, because otherwise, this is like because if it's a sharp, I mean, it's a real thing. I mean, maybe it's not separable, right? Like, maybe there's no separability there. But there Such is a real the distinction. Essence is the defined being. in relation to the being, right? Like, it's just the being inverted. Right? Well, like, no, because it has it has to be like a real it has to be a real distinction because. If I go out of the existence, that means I stop having my active existence. That doesn't mean everything else stops having its active existence. Sure. Right? Or you know, um, my essence is humanity, right? Just because my individuated active existence goes out of existence with my humanity, sure, but that doesn't mean human. No, but if you existence. imagine like all individuation, right? Like that, like, do you know what I mean? Like, it, it's like, obviously there's the good of the, like, I would agree, like when we talk about the, and there is the good of the the species, for example, right, which is not defined by the the particular member, but all of the members of the species, right? Um, like sure, but and I, and I agree. Um, but it's not like actually really ontologically separable from its existence, such that like your specific instantiation, sure. But not entirely, like not entire, like, mm. like it, it. And I mean, the only reason I'm saying this is specifically because in the case, because if we were to say, like, for example, if we, let's say we, were to, we we could agree that let's say deliberately birthing a hundred million children to starve and die would be wrong, right? Like unnecessarily, mm. like where we could have avoided that. It's probably you probably should, right? Like, fair enough. Mm. Um, then it seems that we're implying that there is a point in which in terms of compassion, in terms of the, the virtues of a Christian life, we'd say that we are considering their lived experiences. Now, um, now, now isn't, isn't that only evil because of a privation, right? So, like, again, right, it's the being, like, the being of the million children is good, but their manner of being is evil, 
their manner of being is a privation on the being itself. But it's, that's the thing. It's a privation of there. being. That's the thing. So it's the truth. The truth yeah. defines it such that, like, their frustration. It's like their being isn't good because their being is being is a privation of their act, how they ought to be. Like that's why we would say it's bad, right? Like there is a privation of their being. They, they, yeah, and yeah. and that if if that's the case, then that's their that the privation of their being isn't just their mere existence; it's their experience of their existence. It, it's that they are mm -hmm. being frustrated; they are suffering, and that's what it means to suffer, right? Um, uh, and in which case, we could imagine, let's, say, and this is what I was trying to get at with the case of this person. This person, okay, but, but again, it's it's. Like, I still think it's important to clarify. This is this is parasitic on being, right? So well, it's you know, how we it's understand not... being, right? Like it's not. It's like remember, like like, in the same way that the truth of being is the unity of being in essence, such that if the essence if the essence of the being is being frustrated, then the then it is an absence of being, and it and that's why it's bad. Like we would say, like it's not good because it's an absence of being, such that it exists, but it is an absence of what it ought to be, right? Like, but then, but then, like its its existence can be frustrated as well, not just essence, meaning like. They could die, go out of existence. Sure, sure, I agree there. Like, obviously, like, uh, that, uh, but I mean, that's the frustration of the same thing, which is actually the truth of the being, which is, which forms the ontological basis. So it's like, substantially, it's, it, well, it's the substance of the being, which is like the truth of the being that is being frustrated. Um, and that's why it, it, it can have this relation. But then we could imagine that there are certain times in which reproduction is harmful and certain times when a being's existence like the reason that we would say it's harmful is because of the lived experiences of certain beings right which mm. tells me that the good of reproduction can't just be uh, an act of procreation but an act of procreation which leads to certain conditions which procreate the spirit if you will procreate the truth of of the human condition the 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 um the the flourishing of humanity hmm. okay sorry i was getting my charger i was listening to what you were saying now okay so being he's not it's the essence okay but like i think okay like like you would agree that like like posterior to a child's existence, right? If I go ahead and kill him, so I wipe him out of being, that that act is evil. Right? Uh, yeah. Like obviously, if you deliberately, but like if I, unless I mean, yeah, obviously yeah, we like, can we can say that there's like, like the whole point of why I brought in sort of like mercy killing before was just to say like there could be an act in which you frustrate their existence in order to preserve their essence, and that's the uh, the truth of their being. And I was trying to point out that. If it's going to continually get worse, such that they live more and more and frustrate their uh, being more and more and suffer and suffer and suffer, mm -hmm. that either to one, either prolo artificially prolong their existence would be like an act of evil, right? Or, but so, um, so they're tending towards non-being. That's what I'm hearing. Yes, but I would right, say that okay. non, but non-being isn't defined by their mere existence, right? It's defined by the relationship between being and essence. By like, so it's not just their being here; yeah, they're being actively frustrated. Like, okay, yeah, that's fine. Their their essence is being okay. Yeah, that's that's fine. Yeah, but like before before they exist, that's not evil, right? No, I, I agree. So like, like not I mean, all cases like, of non being are evil, right. It's, well, I like, mean, non being, I mean, Augustine says, is going from being to non being. That's what well, evil is. Well, I mean it. I mean, like obviously, like it depends on what you mean by like before, like before, like obviously that this specific instance of evil couldn't exist without without them sure like like if god didn't create that wouldn't be evil um like no like you mean let's say like someone's not born or something like that but even or, if he just decided not to create at all um uh, well sure um because it would already pr imply the perfect unity of like goodness right <laughs> like in god himself um, yeah but so I'm just saying, like, like him not creating is not evil, right? Yes, I I agree. Yeah. 
So okay, so so okay, so so it seems like it seems like we agree that evil is going from non-being to being. It's not just non-being itself. Yes, it's a private a, a privation of of uh, of the truth of the being. If you could you could see it that way, I would say it does. Of 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 the okay. the the reason that like if the if the truth of the being is essentially the unity of the the being with itself, right? Like its identity or a sufficient reason or like the actual the actuality of that being is the real reason like because as, as a hegelian we say what is rational is actual um mm. then if it's frustrated in terms of let's say you were to kill someone and prevent them from achieving like and flourishing in their life that's to that would frustrate their um <laughs> frustrate the the truth of that being and likewise you could you could say that somebody was suffering and dying to the point in which the it's already being frustrated and it's going to get frustrated more and more and you're seeking to ease that frustration um and i think yeah. that that could be justified under certain circumstances um and so like okay. the, the 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 point is to say like obviously the mere existence isn't the good the truth is the good mm -hmm. Okay. So Okay, well, okay, like let let's say in like in the incest in the uh, incestuous act, right? Of uh um I would say that act is evil because it's an act going from non-being to being. Sorry, going from being to non-being, right? Because that, that's what I would say is incorrect about it because it's producing something that is like like it's the act is not good because it is mm. I would say that it's I mean, necessary. what is that makes sense that's bad well, I think there's two senses you could say that on one yeah, sense could... that it that it that the existence of a being is going to be frustrated such that you perpetuate an individual who can't actually form a like the essence of like well, such that the, the truth of the being is always going to be frustrated, right? In one sense, a being could be born simply to suffer and die. Um, and that seems to prevent their flourishing in... Okay, that one... seems like part of your intention when you do that act, right? Uh, yes, or at least it has to be point of a part of like reason like a reasonable actor would know that this is a, a consequent which they would have to take responsibility yeah, yeah. for right so like even if you don't intend so that for it is to a happen, kind of going from non-being sort of to being, reckless endangerment right? or something right. right you could say it's no. like yeah uh, uh, um, yeah yeah uh, but but so that, that is we, a kind so of going from say it's like being if to we say being right yeah in the sense that if we say that like the like the like being is truth and not just because oh. obviously if they did just produce a being which suffered let's say its entire life but existed um that would be bad in itself because it would frustrate the essence of the being the, the truth of the being even though there is an existence there but if it was just merely being in the sense of like being as existence quote unquote then it would just be uh the the abstract addition of a person would be good right and then you'd end yeah. up with a kind of utilitarianism where we should just have as many babies mm -hmm. as possible without considering their lived experiences um and then also the thing that in the other side of the incestuous act that's wrong is likely to be the psychological relationship between the people who are committing the act such that it isn't unitive um um that they okay. like it's possible but like it's likely to be coercive uh manipulative okay. uh narcissistic things like that you know so 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 the main thing here is that like you're willfully producing something that could die immediately. Will, yeah willfully producing something that could suffer and die yeah um, okay so that is a kind of going from and also the psychological the, manipulation the, yeah which is bad right. for which frustrates their being if you will yeah okay so like i think i think if you if you took all immoral procreative acts i i think there's there's some analysis of that we could give to them right like we could give some analysis in in a way that they're trying to produce something that brings about non-being Right. You think we could do that? Um, in relation to truth, yes, I do. Yeah, so, like, yeah. not just existence, but the truth of the existence, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm still producing a child, right? I'm just 
yeah. producing a child that could immediately die, right? Um, or, or suffer immensely uh, or, you yeah. know, unnecessarily, yeah. There, there, there seems to be an act of uh, inconsideration uh, such that you're not willing the good of the species. Yeah, okay, you lack consideration. Yeah, okay, that's, yeah. that's one. Okay, so but there are some lacks there. Okay, so I think for, for all those acts, you could give some kind of account of that. What I would say is for the homosexual act, there's, there's a lack that happens there in the sense that it's not essentially procreative, which is what the, which is what the organs are for. I so I would say they're frustrating the, the organs in the act. I don't see that would frustrating say. the organs in the act. I think, that the, I think that the homosexuality has frustrated their capacity to have a loving reproductive relationship. Yeah, well, I, I'll say but... this: it's frustrating their it's frustrating their organs um, necessarily, not merely accidentally. Right? No, like, I, like I, the, no, I think the point of it's like where's the frustration happening? Where do you think the frustration's happening? I think the frustration no happened. No, 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 no. I think. The, I mean, <laughs> sorry, it just it was just how sharply you responded with the organs. I think the frustration <laughs> like happening not just. In, I don't think it's happening in the organs. I think that the frustration's happening. In terms of the, the the you could say it's the the being of the individual, but only in so far as that they are able to will the universal good of humanity. So, like, are they willing the 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 good of all, such that like when we when you reproduce, are you willing the good of the of all ends? Right now, I think that the only thing stopping them from doing that under certain circumstances, right? Because, like, as we can agree, even heterosexual relationships under certain circumstances, it's not always willing. Like, the act isn't always willing the good. So the only thing stopping them from doing that under certain circumstances is the thing which prevents and frustrates the unitative act of procreation, which is their psychology of being homosexual. Um... Which they yeah, no, no, I, I agree they might have a psychology of being homosexual, but like I was just talking about the act, right? So you can have a psychology of being homosexual and not engage yeah. in the acts. Like yeah. you could want to become a mo Yeah, but I, right? I but like look at it like this. Like so I like so actually I guess this is probably where it needs to be. Is I don't think I think you could will the good of all individuals and be having sex in a heterosexual way without it leading to a child or without you even intending it to lead to a child okay i don't i don't think even the intent is necessary as we're talking about it now I, all, all i want to argue for is that it, it essentially does it right so if, if everything were working properly and essentially a child would would be brought about right as opposed to you know if i got a but like the good of the child is the good of the species. So surgery like the, that made that. Sorry, like it, like, so it's like the good of the existence of the child is good for is the good of the species, such that the particular existence of the child is defined in the universal relation between the species, such that we can say certain acts frustrate the un, like the good, even though it's reproductive, right? Like, oh yeah. Now, now again, right? I like I, I admitted that there like there is some non -be there is some being to non being in some procreative acts. So I, I already admitted that, right? But like now, now I'm saying that okay, the organs which were made for procreation, right? They themselves are being frustrated because in in one act, one act is necessarily procreative. When you say that, I, that I'm kind of thought, I'm kind of confused of when you say the organs themselves are being frustrated because mm -hmm. I see the organs as a means to an end to produce a consequence for a human life. Like I don't think that the organs define. Like, this is the kind of point, I don't think the organs define the good of the species such that, like, if we, like, the existence of the organs doesn't exhaust the, like, the, 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 the truth of the species, right? Like, it's to do with, like, because obviously you can have all of the organs present at the time in which people are going to suffer and die in the scenarios we've gave, um, and it's, you know, you could say that, like, oh, you know, like, or, you know, even in terms of, uh, and, you know, there's a point in which, you know, the, the, it's not the, it's not the frustration of the organs that's the problem. I'd say it's the frustration of the individuals from which the, or the holistic organism, which makes the organs intelligible. 
such that like someone is actually suffering and in pain like you could even imagine this right in which all the organs are working properly um i guess it would be difficult to say all the organs are working properly but then someone's in suffering and pain because i'm not going to make a di direct deviation between being an essence such that you can just have a being without an essence you know what i mean um but let's say you could have um you know you can have the 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 organs themselves are given meaning in relation to the unity of the body such that like when you say like a hand cut off from the body is a hand yeah, yeah. by name right such that like so it, it's in relation to the fulfillment of the good of the organism right and i don't think that the good of the organism is exhausted in the good of the organ the organ is defined in relation to the good of the organism right so it's kind of like it's part of it like it's it, you know but yeah the organs are only made intelligible by the mm -hmm. by the whole yeah and i yeah. would say that the whole is only made intelligible in relation to a psych in relation to the mind right so like the mind's relation to the body is what like i can see like the subject's relation to another subject and their relation to their physical body also defines the organs not just an objective like in the same sense if i was to remove the organ it wouldn't be the organ it's it's its relationship to the other organs and specifically the and even in the body's relationship to the mind which makes the body intelligible right so 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 here here in this case you you really don't think we can just scrutinize the act and say even though the psychology might be fine maybe the act isn't fine right mm -hmm. No, no, like I, I mean, don't. for example, I would say psychologically, it's okay for you to be attracted to men. I mean, I, the Catholic Church holds that, right? Um, you would just say the act isn't allowed, right? You're not allowed to. I, I understand that. Um, I just like the reason I think that the act is, is said to not be allowed in the first place is because we're analyzing this from a point of, and this is kind of the point when I said ont ontologically, where you're taking in a in terms of ontology, you're saying it's made intelligible by. Uh, a stance of objectivity where i'm saying it's made in a stance of like absolute in relation between objectivity and subjectivity so that the object is defined in relation to our relationship to it as well so it's like like and that's fine an act requires a subject but like like do, do you really think that needs like we need to go into the psychology right like yeah like I don't, the example of I, set. yeah i mean like i don't right. like yeah, like i don't think like the psychology, like, the reason why that's wrong is because it's a deliberate willing of the frustration of the species, right? The truth of the species. And that's defined in relation to the psychology. Like, it's not just some sort of, like, it's not just the physicality and the objectivity. That's part of it. Like, that's, that's us observing the psychology being frustrated in many ways, right? Like, mm -hmm. so it's like, in the same way as I can observe, like, a heart complaint and then I can see someone in pain like such that i can see that like you could imagine like someone has a heart defect like so for example i technically i've had my heart scanned before and i have okay. like a slight back flow in my heart right such that it doesn't cause any real functional issues right or, or any pain right mm -hmm. but let's say someone was to have like like that could be increased to like uh like in the sense that like so like a, basically everyone's hearts are going to have something like that right like that no one like it's it like oh every everyone's organs aren't going to be perfectly functioning like that's just the way like humans are like we're not these like sort of like perfect machines and like in the same sense that like my heart doesn't impede my natural functioning um unless it's impeding our natural functioning it's not really an observable problem and the way that we can perceive that like so if it's not, let's say, causing an individual suffering, or if it's not preventing them from uh, achieving some some good for another, which means also willing a, a psychological good for another, then it's just a difference, right? Mm. It doesn't it doesn't have any meaning beyond that. Like it's not a defect in the sense that it's not actually causing a problem. The problem's defined in relation to the subject's experience. And so okay, like, well, okay. I, I think I caught something in your example. This this might be like a heavy disagreement that doesn't require us to go to. 
super big ontology. Do you think that an intentional action is action plus intention? Like as though like we have to formulate an intention. Um, There's something called the intentional thought. Um, and then the like, intentional thought plus the action equals the intentional act. Um, I mean, it depends on what you mean by intent. I mean, I think like if you were to sure, I think I would probably say that there, there is in one sense, in the sense that I think you can do something that is um, like all acts are intentional in one respect, in a sort of trivial sense. Um such that it is one with the process of acting, right? But when we say, like, for example, when we talk about, like, uh, mens rea or, like, a guilty mind or something like that, and something being mm -hmm. deliberate, what we usually mean is that there was a perverse reasoning involved in the action. Mm -hmm. So the act, the, the, the act itself is defined by a perverse reasoning. Um, and that's why, like, we would say that there is a difference between like there is a difference between an act of running someone over manslaughter and the act of running someone over murder, even though both are defined in relation to uh, the consequent. The consequent is defined within relation to the psychology of the individual deliberately perpetuating a perverse reasoning, reasoning an injustice. Okay, I think. Okay, I think I think this might be a difference. I like. I see you kind of have Kant's kind of interpretation of intention. I, I take Derrida's critique of intention very seriously, right? And I think it's equivalent to Thomas's view of intention. Um, so that 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 might be that that might be like a very important difference we have, which I won't totally go into that because I think it makes sense because then what you'd be saying is that by so what you're saying is that. Like, and if I understand this, uh, the point of the homosexual act, despite like it couldn't be loving because the intentionality has nothing necessary or isn't defined in relation to acting in accordance with certain reasons. No, I think I think it has something to do with acting in relation to certain reasons. I mean, there there's a whole argument Anscombe has that uh, I think we should take another time to talk about it because I think Max wants to talk as well. But, um, oh, you just don't, don't I, I have to don't go in worry. a second. I was going to say, don't worry about Max. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I do have to go in a second, but, um, um, you know, I'm also like, I'm also not as like, I used to talk about natural law a while ago, but at this point I'm kind of in the weeds of scholasticism. So I don't think about it that much. And you now actually when, um, An like hounding wanted to talk to me about it, I told him to go talk to, uh, Anselmian and Max. Because I just, uh, I'm not the best at arguing natural law. I just, I just really wasn't getting like what your objection was. Okay, but but now it seems like your objection is the act is only intelligible to a psychology, right? Yeah, like I don't that, believe that, that seems we like could what do, you're saying. Yeah, and I, I think that's a wrong view of intention. That's that's probably uh, you see that, but that's what I'm saying. I it, like in general, like I, I think that the difference is ontological, such that the subject. Like the psychology and the lived experiences of the subject make intelligible the object. Like that's why I'm saying this disagreement's like fundamentally ontological. Like I make intelligible the object. You mean make intelligible the act? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Like well, like the act. We're talking about the act. They, the the right. well, yeah, but like even in terms of like an act as an object of your experience, or even just an act as in like an objective occurrence. Like you, the the your relationship to reality and reality itself. Um cannot be devoid like you cannot have a non-agent like um what's the way to, to say this like a, a a merely objective or external consideration of reality um like in the same way that i think you believe that the like in when you talk about like blackness being present mm -hmm you're saying that it, like the actual truth of the color is present rather than your the, whether any subject perceives it or not yeah where i i do not i don't okay you say it i don't think you believe that you're not a berkeley an idealist no i'm not but i am an idealist i know but it's an app I, I don't know i i like we should talk about this some other time because i'd i'd want to go more into that epistemology 
Um, and uh, yeah, okay, but I, I did I did want to ask you something before I left. Yeah, I'm about sorry. your discussion, and this is something I could definitely get more into, which is your discussion of uh, oh, with Max the other day, you had a discussion about prime matter, and you said form right. like ma- prime matter, or sorry, matter is form made concrete. You said that, right? Yeah, um, I'm willing to like sort of express it more, and you can make the difference between essence and form if you'd like as well. Like, but I, I would say that prime matter is um i think it was it uh prime matter in hegel really can be understood as ground so like where the ground is um and that not really uh uh you know what i'll summon that as well hell to it right so wait wait pp okay so this guy named aaron said typically mario runs away when he's no, I don't when, think that's true. I don't. When think he's that's cornered. True. Yeah, I, you don't think I'm running away, I right? Don't th- I, mean... I don't think you're running away. No, I don't think you're running away. I think that's uh, like I don't think it's good to engage in that kind of like petty, sort of uh-huh. uh, like one-upmanship in terms of these conversations. I don't think that you're like scared and can't answer. I think we're having a thoughtful discussion. So yeah, no, no, um, I, I was like yeah. really concerned because I wasn't sure what your objection was. I didn't, I didn't think you like. I I almost didn't see that you were objecting to what I was talking about, right? But then it just seems to me that then we came to a headway at intention, which we could argue about, but I have to go soon and I want to talk about prime matter. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's fair. Like, I, I, <laughs> honestly, I don't think you're running away. So, okay. um, yeah, just in relation to prime matter and just in terms of ground, like, so when Hegel talks about something essentially like the ground, like he's going to say that, um, that we are talking about essentially like what we're talking about sort of potency in itself um um i'll have to get the the specifics i was reading the passage on it like only earlier like uh mm-hmm. i think it was last night actually because after we had this conversation like after you brought it up i was like does hegel say about prime matter um and i started right so this. so my understanding is prime matter is the most potential principle because it has the potential to take on any form yeah, it's just it's sort of abstract potentiality, such that it, it yeah, it, uh, and and it's made it's only possible in relation to a real into a reality, which is essentially it's made con- which yeah, it makes concrete. because anything that has concrete existence has form. Yeah, right. And, and, so matter can't have concrete existence because it has the potential to be any form. Yeah, and what Hegel's going to say is that that means it's just really an instrumentation of making form concrete, such that it is the means in which something is made concrete which means that it is the essence of making something concrete. Okay, yeah, I'd like to know what that means more because, like, for example, Aristotle and Aquinas both say the principle of change is matter, right? Um, so that, you know, if, if, a, if, a, if a carnivorous bird, if a carnivorous bird came down to kind of eat my flesh, mm-hmm. then the prime matter that belonged to my body would take on the form of the bird, right? But it would still be the same prime matter. Um, yes, um, insofar as, um, like, uh, what Hegel's going to say is basically that the actuality of your, of your being has fallen into the potentiality of what it could become in the bird in the decomposition process. So, like, um, and then it can be made concrete by the process of like um but it just sounds like, like from, from what you said it it sounds like from what you said it's form which is the principle of change right because if 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 well, all matter is it's just form made concrete right then it sounds like when something changes it's because of the form not because of the not because of the matter um well only in so far as it's like logical relations right in the sense that the truth of the form like it it depends it's like like if it depends on what we mean by like the form in in this respect anyway like but in the sense that the truth so the truth of like like when we look at it like the truth of you and the truth of the bird such that they have been made manifest through a being made concrete through uh, a certain process of individuation 
um, then through the interaction of those of these two facts of these of essentially these two truths now you have this you have a fact being broken down into its essentially one-sided constituents which is its actuality and its potentiality such that the identity can then sort of be destroyed and re remade if you will um but that this is like hegel's going to say that this is a like and I think the, the the main thing I was trying to express with this is that Hegel's going to say that fundamentally, at the fundamental bo- rock bottom of this, we are going to see that the 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 truth of existence is essence, uh, in the sense that it is uh, a real logic which individuates itself. So it's not like like the essence individuates itself into the specific material conditions which we see um or is individuated yeah, cause, into the- okay because you, you also said to max max like you also said to max matter isn't real right? yeah i don't think hegel wants to say that i think he wants to say matter is real insofar it is his thought not in like a not yeah. like a, like a concrete thought but in an absolute thought yeah right? i mean i'm happy to say that in in insofar as it is true with the idea and like that it's a petrified yeah. intelligence so it's one-sided so, like the it is just idea taken in its one sidedness when we talk about matter in the abstract, which is just talking about the idea and its potency. Um, so Hegel's not going to say so. Like he's just going to say like okay, but, but then like you say that when again when you say that that matter like, uh, that for, like matter is just concrete. It seems like you're saying matter doesn't exist. It seems like you're saying. All that happens is form is being concrete. Well, like, look at it like this. Like, what Hegel's looking for is, like, at the point of, like, absolute particularity. Like, this is just a, fo- this mm. is just a means of particularization, right? Like, that's, right. that's all he's saying it as. Uh, and absolute particularity is nothing, which doesn't exist. And so what we end up is the smallest possible particularization of the idea. Um, and that's going to be usually what we refer to in terms of physical sciences, right? Where we start like thinking atomistically, then subatomically and down and down and down. Um, Mm -hmm. But is, is not like, um, I would just see those as like the potential for prime matter to be broken down. Well, like, it's not like, I don't think, so you'd see that as the potential of prime matter to be broken down. I don't think of it as, um, like I don't see like human cells or something or like atoms inside of a human person as a re- as a real substance. I see them only as like virtually in the substance. Yeah, I mean, like it depends on what you like. Obviously, like you mean like in the sense of the yes, okay, so it's a constituent part of a whole. It's made intelligible, yeah. yeah. But obviously, like atoms would be, wouldn't they? Like so, for example, like your like like for example, the substance of specific elements wouldn't be defined by i mean like by you your specific substance like such that you could imagine iron like the substance of iron like in terms of like a sword or something being separate from you and that'll be yeah, yeah no i mean it can be different prime matter of course right i mean that's that's the principle of change the principle of change is that things different things are div- given different prime matter right that's under my view at least right when you say, yeah, you say I, I don't think that they like i don't see prime matter i see prime matter as a sink like and this is i think hegel's point prime matter is not like prime matter isn't the matter prime matter isn't something that you find differently in different things prime matter is just the principle of individuation which you, which is and it, and even in like like the like the thomistic account doesn't like doesn't like thomas basically say that uh like it is matter with all form removed uh which just exists as pure potency um so it's not like it could be individual there's nothing in it like the form individuates the prime matter such that like i can't think of it as like there's one prime matter and there's another prime matter if it has no form aquinas thinks matter is what individuates form i would say aristotle believes that as well but there's a controversy with Suarez whether or not he thinks Aquinas, whether or not he thinks okay, Aristotle believes it. But I think in general, most like, people in the believe sense that I don't, Aristotle. Like, I, I know I agree with you, but I think when we look at prime matter, it's not as if there are multiple prime matters. Like, there's not prime matters. 
Like, I don't think of, I think of it as a universality, abstract, ill-defined, and so is essentially the, uh, you know, you could think of this in, in terms of, um, as, uh, as, as essentially pure quality or something, right? Like, it's, uh, or, or, or rather even like pure quantity, it's, uh, it's it's nothingness it's um it's not you can't see it as multiple objects because what gives it meaning um you know because there's no such thing as uninformed matter right well i mean there's no such thing yeah but then so what do we mean by prime matter then like when you say like so obviously prime matter doesn't exist in itself because it well but now but now it exists in me for example yeah, like there's prime matter in like me. We would agree, yeah, what but, I would say. But like prime matter is just like what we're doing is we're removing the uh what we're doing is specifically removing the um I would say what well, what the prime matter the, is, it's whatever like taking on the form. Like all we're saying well. is that like yeah, so it's like the thing which is specifically related to the form, but if we remove the form We've removed you, right? We would agree with that, right? You can't, you can't be you without the form, yeah. So, like, uh, so, like, what's left? It's pure potency, so it can't be actual, which means that it's in its. Oh yeah, I, I like, said that, but like, it's but like okay, since so I it have can't be a uh, thing, the act of existence, right? Um, and it, all all prime matter here has as has in some sense the act of existence in some way right um all that happens is okay there, there's the act of existence individuated by the essence mm -hmm. right and then further down there's the form individuated by the matter um so um, i i would say in some sense matter is not a thing because thing implies substance right and yes so that's just, that's what i'm trying to say yes okay so yeah. prime so yes that that's but i would still I would, say it exists that that that's what i would say prime matter still exists uh i mean i would say it only exists in the in its in the sense that it is just a a, a, a way in which the um the uh the the, the uh the um form is like i mean it depends like and, and even in a relationship between like essentially when we when we bring it back to let's say being an essence versus form and matter um the like when you want to say like the and and i think aquinas wants to say like the relationship one second i'm just going to quickly yeah uh... I, I have to go um, in like oh sorry a few minutes um, sorry about that no that's all, it's all right i'm just trying to um I just uh, obviously it's a timed game and I can't actually uh yeah yeah um oh bollocks I shouldn't have done that but okay so it's kind of like um right so we'll have like essentially existence and essence versus form and matter is really a relationship between a sort of limited substance and absolute and the absolute right as far as i would understand it um such that it marks the separation between like god and man or like specific contingent creatures and man uh or, yeah. or and, and and god rather uh, would you agree there that's basically the difference but fundamentally the relationship's mm -hmm. the same of some things i mean i don't think i don't think angels have matter for example um or incorporeal bodies i don't no, I don't but think it's just that they're individuated. They're individuated in a different way. That's the only thing I would say. Like it's just that we're yeah, individuated yeah. So, by so a not, certain. Yeah, they're only essentially individuated. They're not individuated as as species. That's, yeah, that's I mean, I'm happy with I'm happy with that. That's yeah. fine. But I think that the only thing that we're individuated, like when you talk about matter, like the only thing that makes like when we talk about matter, I think that's derivable to the point in which it's abstract, categorical uh relations such that it is essentially just quality um it's just a it's a qualitative and quantitative relation like there's no it's just a being it's being made concrete in a certain way 
that that's all it is. It's not like a like a kind of separate truth. Right? Like there's no truth separate of truth. Like it like in the like so for example, Hegel's gonna d d dismiss the idea of a non-idealistic reality, like such that it all falls to the point in which it is grounded in the idea. And so Mata has no reality besides its relationship to subjectivity. It's a petrified intelligence where subjectivity I mean, defines, Hegel thinks matter is itself an idea, right? Um it's a petrified intelligence like they're specific petrified intelligences. Like they're not like it's not an idea that's like a concrete idea in itself. Like it is specific petrified intelligences such that it is petrified forms. Right? So like um which is really just individuated forms, right? So that it and so like at the like there's nothing in which all of these things share in except for that sounds logical. like universal hylomorphism because what, what makes that position different from Avicenna's view, I guess, right? I mean, wouldn't that be in some sense mean that like angels or incorporeal bodies also have prime matter because um, they're individuated form? It depends on us by the process of individuation, right? And like what individuates. Like Hegel wants to say that this process of individuation is just, it's just an imminent logical relation uh between universality and particularity and that forms let's say like categorical relation which means like identities um so like when we look at something like uh, an angel which would be like a, um like a kind of universality within the like a, a relationship between um it's like a, in which it is a concrete universal um as a single being hegel's not going to say that's the same thing as um like a material like what we would call a material being like you know like colloquially um because of its be but because of how it self relates um like we relate to to ourselves through a relationship between universality and particularity um uh, and it's a yeah, wait, I, I wanted I wanted to say something like someone someone said Aquinas on the principles of nature, he lays out his view of the four causes, and he says that there can be matter with there, there can be form without matter, right? Um, and then, but it is a potentiality according to Aquinas. I mean, that's what I thought right? with Aquinas as well. I, I mean, I I understand that because yeah, it's like yeah. archetypical ideas in the mind of God, right? Like, yeah. So so I'll explain what Aquinas meant by that. First of all, Aquinas only thinks form is but is potential only in relation to essence, right? It's actual in relation to matter, right? So, so that's what he means there, right? So it's potential as related to essence, right? So far as the essence could potentially come into being, right? So it exists as a potency of the essence, right? But then matter, but then form only exists actually in matter, right? Or like for for Aquinas, right? If uh if uh or it only exists individuated in matter i should say that it only exists individuated in matter what would really right? help is what what do you think is the metaphysical difference like the ontic difference which defines how an angel is individuated versus uh material objects because that's going to essentially lead us to say like wh why this is different between like the process of individuation is different okay yeah because um, angels don't don't have specific differences between them, right? That there there's nothing that that specifically differs between one angel and another, like you and me, right? So we're both kind of instances of humanity, right? But there are, uh, but um, but uh, oh wait, sorry, that's not what I meant. What I what I meant was like like we like the way we individuate ourselves from each other, right, is by our prime matter. Right, you say that you know I, I'm you and you're me because you t you're world bound, right? So so Aquinas thinks the individual is in some sense world bound. And oh man, this, I'm sorry, this will be the last thing I have to say. Um, no, no, it's all right. Like I think that this it's is a lot this is, because you no, asked no, me no, how angels it's, individuate. It's 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 actually really <laughs> difficult. And like I think yeah. that like in the sense that I would say that we're relate we're interrelated through sort of um 
logical categorization which is objective to our specific existences right such that like we mm -hmm. could say that like uh space and time um and 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 these define our self-relation outside of our subjectivity whereas mm -hmm. a non-corporeal being would not be defined or individuated by these relations but would be individuated only as a, as the unified whole of the species in the same but experiencing itself um so yeah, the, yeah. The, so so, yeah. so so the way i the way i'd put this is like technically in an angel the uh, the form isn't actuated by the matter and that that's the difference in us the form is actuated by the matter right so we have a specific difference plus individual differences right but angels only have specific differences. That's what I meant to say in the beginning. Angels only have specific differences. It's kind of like a as though there could only be one instance of humanity, one instance of animality, one instance of whatever, right, whatever species you want to take in animality, right? If there could only be one instance of those, that's what an angel is like. Yeah. Right? Each and, and, angel and, is individuated by its species difference. Right? And, 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 and I mean, like, which they like, essentially, I, I I get that, and I but I think that the what we will have to say though, and I think that this is like my 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 whole difference here is like when you talk about matter, it seems like you want to say matter as a a specific thing, rather than the way in which a being is related to its relates to itself. I don't right. want to say it's a thing, and I don't want to say it's a self relation either. I'd like to say it's a principle of change right where the where the principle of change exists in the thing right so i would say matter has a concrete existence in a thing that's why the same way form has a concrete existence yes. in me yes no i mean I, I would agree there but that's just a that that is i would say just categorical self relation um mm. okay so i guess i, yeah, I guess it depends on what we mean like <laughs> it's concrete like uh -huh. there is a real category there like it's a real okay. logical category such that like things like space and time like they really exist but it's not and and that's what individuates matter such that when we talk about matter what we're actually talking about is logical relations between objects within essentially a four-dimensional or you know maybe multiple dimension depending on how you understand physics like relationship with each other and so it's just how contingent beings relate with relation to certain or with re relation to certain categories but if you were to go beyond those categories right then and to the point uh, and this is what like hegel's kind of relating to with the point in which you like you transcend like the the relationships that we perceive in terms of physicality then you gain the the foundations of those categories and then that's where like angels and god essentially exist you know, in not like defined by the categories, but at the point in which the categories are being defined. Mm, okay, I, I mean, we probably have to talk about it because I don't think God is individuated, but I don't, I don't know if you're saying that. I mean, okay, I like before I go, which I really do have to go. I like to clarify some things that CEP asked about Aquinas. He said Aquinas uses essence to explain something, exemplifies to explain why something exemplifies universal. Yeah, CEP, but that's that's exactly his objection against Avicenna, right? Because Avicenna is going to say that essence is purely form, whereas Aquinas is going to say essence is form and matter, right? If essence is the definition of a thing, right? Then you're right, there is a kind of universality embedded in that, but Aquinas also thinks essence also includes a thing's prime matter, right? So that, that'd be the difference between Avicenna and Aquinas. Um... So, okay, that comes after specifying first form and matter, potentiality, actuality. But you have to remember for Aquinas, there, there's a few degrees of potency act. The most like concrete is substance accident, right? And then the more abstract it gets, the more it goes from form matter, right? And then finally, the, the final one is act of existence and essence. That for Aquinas is the most... Uh, that for Aquinas is the most fundamental act and potency a thing has. It's not matter and form. It's uh, it's essence and existence. 
That's that's why Aquinas thinks uh, we can have uh, our potential intellects can be individuated for Aquinas because um, Avicenna doesn't think so. Avicenna thinks it's just one big world mind, like the second hypothesis of Plotinus. Or is, like the reason, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, but that's the thing. But the reason he's making the distinction isn't, I don't think, derived, like, in the sense that, like, we could say that, obviously, it's as you said, like, it's, um, like last time, it's specifically the, well, like, essentially God's role in the process of individuation. Um, wait, hold so on, wait. See, CEP said Aqu for Aquinas. Matter is potential existence. No, that's not true. Essence is potential existence. Just wanted to say that. Um, I mean, yes, but I think that I, no, I'm. I think I'm going to hold you up if I just start talking. So, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's. I don't know. Like, say, say, like, I, I want you to have the last word. So, no, no, no. I just, I just think we should talk about it again some more. Like, that's that's really all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, like a hundred percent. I'm I'm glad we had this conversation, and I still think I'm right, and I think homosexuals can have loving gay sex. Um, uh, so you know, uh, I, I think the church should hopefully allow them to marry, given that I'm correct and peer reviewed and mm -hmm. shown to be correct. And if I am, then mm -hmm. then then yeah, we should we should allow them to marry. So okay, all but, right. But yeah, See you, take it easy, man. Okay. CEP's actually in call waiting. Hello, CEP. How are you doing, man? I will say I've, I'm only going to be on for probably another 10 more minutes or so because it is half three here. Hello. How are you doing, mate? I've, I've pro I was just saying I've probably only got about 10, 10 minutes, maybe 15, just because it's half, half past three in the morning here. Gotcha. So, how? What can I do for you, man? How you doing? Yeah, how are you doing? Um, so I, I we've never really talked too much about uh, logic before, you and I. No, no, definitely we have not, and I know you're like a logician, which is probably makes sense as to why we haven't, because it will be well a very painful conversation for me. You'll you'll absolutely know more about it than me. So come on. It is a curious title uh, for the live stream tonight. Edward Fazer, Natural Law and Sexual Ethics. It was. It was. Uh, uh, you may have. To, you may have to rename that. I, um, I, did, so, not, that I, I mean, I, I did. I did actually mean to rename that. So, like, uh, yeah. one second. Did I not change it on Twitch? No, I haven't. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that's part of philosophy, Collins. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. I did. I was originally. I, were you here when I was? You were here when I was like reviewing that weren't you? Uh, I was reviewing a video titled that. Um, yes, then, that's how you started yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Just forgot to change the title. Sorry, continue. Continue. Great, so just remind me again, so what's your orientation about logic? Because um, I heard you're interested in things like traditional logic or um, maybe medieval Yeah, you mean logic. like in terms of how I understand logic? Um... Yes. I suppose that um, in terms of specific logical structures, I think that all of these are really only referential against a real logic which we're trying to understand, which essentially governs the rules of thought. Um, as far as I understand those rules of thought, I would... Um, one second, that's before I die here. One second, I need to quickly... Uh, um, I don't think that there's oh shit, I shouldn't have I shouldn't have put that one first. Um I mean, we're all kind of already being quite romantic yeah, here sir. and making reference to like George Boole's like laws of thought sort of in a way, as opposed to maybe laws of nature. Um well laws <laughs> of nature would be I think equal I mean like I'm not gonna say there's a separation between laws of thought and nature necessarily anyway. As a Hegelian, um, so what's rational is actual. Um, Maybe. Um, well, that's like the position I would take in terms of ontology. So, sure. um, 
I think it's going to be in reference to this sub, sub, subject object relationship, the absolute, which defines all reality for he, for Hegel. Um, how much how much logic have you had? Um, not loads of logic in terms of like the study of like analytic because I did continental philosophy anyway, so we don't do like um, sort of typically detached logic uh, as a as a way of actually engaging. So really not not that much um gotcha mostly just considerations of things like prop logic uh um, i mean even if you do study i mean even if you spent most of your time studying continental philosophy or uh the early modern philosophy still um there is still uh room uh, according to any continental uh, oh, 100%. uh studying some kind of logic oh right, yeah there's definitely room for it like i'm not saying that it's not a good sub like a good uh a good way to um like I a, wasn't. I wasn't implying that. I was just sort of cutting to the chase, real quick. Um, since we only have ten minutes, basically, and the clock is ticking, so um, the idea is, what I wanted to, when I, I guess maybe I was like caught up or, or kind of stumbling over a little bit, was the was use the word pre-existence, right? So if I say that something pre-exists, right, I would just also be. It would mean the same thing for me uh, that something exists. Like there would just be no difference. Sorry, could you I mean, say, I'm could coming you, from, I am, yes. Sorry, could you, could you say that again? So you're yes, I can that, say that again. Yeah, sorry. So when I say that something pre-exists, right, that would just mean the same thing for me, that something exists. Um, sort of the, the, the uh, prefix of pre in front of exists uh, would be doing really no work. And I am coming from the analytic philosophical angle here. Um. Um, and that's in relation to me saying what so like i'm not sure if i disagree so in oh when i just I heard you say it i just remember you saying pre-exists pre uh, uh, logical relations pre-exist and i was curious about that oh no, yeah i mean no no i'm, I'm i would would hap i'd happily say that there is a unity between existence and logical relations such that i only mean those specific that the logical relations, when I said pre-exist, like a specific, it's more like a specific kind of being, not existence itself. Um, so what I'm really saying is that like, uh, like, like temporally, like, or even um, dialectically, the way in which uh, a being is manifested is defined by how logic works. Um, really, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I want to. I want to give you an idea about how I think about things. Uh, and and if I were to think about it within a logical theory, I'm just going to give you an idea. All right. So imagine, if you will, a a a, a deduction system, right? Where what we're doing is we start out from certain logical axioms and rules of inference within our within our deduction system, okay, and we and we just start proving logical truths uh, with uh, with respect to uh, just whatever logic we're working with, and we just keep proving and proving and proving, and and, and before we know it, we have a giant, massive, long list of a list of these logical truths. That we've deduced mm -hmm. one from the other, okay, yeah. and that somewhere, whatever it is that we've taken to be true, occurs within this list at some point, okay. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. usually, I operate with some kind of like second order logic, where I could have, where I can use a comprehension principle by which I would instantiate uh, what would be uh, the logical form of the of theoretical definitions. These theoretical definitions are what philosophers use um, when they're speaking a bit more loosely or in with natural language about it, where they're going, they want to give a definition of a concept, right? Mm -hmm. They want to lay out how a method that they're going to use, whether hypothetically or, or whether it's supposed to be actually applied within some given discipline, how it's supposed to work. So when they do this, right? This will occur at some point if we gave it, transcribed it within a logical theory. It will occur at some point in that list of truths in our in that deduction system. You see, 
And so when we want to figure out whatever concepts it is, and it doesn't matter what traditional one comes from, the idea is to locate it logically in some kind of deduction system like that. That's how I approach things. Right. So, so I'm trying to make sure that I understand what you're saying. So, if we, so we're imagining that there's uh, essentially a logic which built upon certain axioms that we've chosen, and through the yes. application of the through the application of those axioms and through a deduct through the process of deduction, we formulate various proofs and that somewhere in this yes. in these various proofs we find the is it that we find the second order logic that you're referencing or that we find the uh the truth of the axioms we find the location by which our principles by which we reason from the definitions of the concepts that we use in our reasoning we find the location of them in that massive list of truths is the idea that somehow somehow they're there right i mean in the sense of it like being a tautology like yes right um Sure. So they're asserted and then prove themselves in relation to themselves. Well, that they are deduced from other more basic principles. And that once we have them, we then go about using them to reason about other uh, other matters that occur right. to our mind. So it's almost right. a constant process of um, of, of essentially applying principles to find principles to apply principles to find principles. Yes. I mean, I would agree with you there because I think that's the basis of something like hermeneutics. Right? Um, I like hermeneutics. Uh, Actually, uh, I, I've been kind of uh, getting into it a little bit more. Uh, particularly, I have a couple textbooks on biblical hermeneutics. Um, I'm, I'm even, uh, I'm even just philosophical hermeneutics. So in the sense that, like, in terms of, well, I don't have Hans, I don't have Hans Georg Gadamer's philosophical hermeneutics yet, but that's going to be on the list. That's, that's a solid one. I'd, 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 um, hundred percent. But in the sense that it's the hermeneutic circle of sort of, uh, you could even imagine it as like logical application. Like logic is interp in performing logic, it is a self-interpreting exercise. Or uh, in, in which it is interpreting and translating itself into a, let's say, like maybe a, a purer form or a more, um, a more exact form of itself. And now that's uh, basically to be precise. Yes, uh, to be precise, there are some logics that can do that. Uh, they're usually called meta logics or meta theoretic logics. They are logics whose logical languages are equipped syntactically to give term representations to formulas within. That language so so uh some logics don't have that but the I, logics that do uh -huh. there is that self-interpretation the yeah that makes it obviously what i would say is that's that's essentially that's i would think of that in in many ways in terms of like a real logic right such that there is a real fittingness which is like oh yeah, that, that's by far the meta theoretic yeah. ones are the more preferable ones obviously it seems that the ones that with without that capability are, are a bit like what we call toy logical theories you yeah know, is it's what you find in an introductory textbook yeah um yeah i mean that's uh, i would agree um, uh, um which is yeah and that's really great and i think that's what hegel's getting at in terms of essentially um hit the process of his logic um such that it has ontological ramifications all the way down the line in terms of that it is um that this is the pro that that what we're talking about when we perceive ontology differently and when we reveal these truths that ontology is actually moving through that process um and that is the underlying structure if you will of uh of the sort of hegelian system which is like the self the absolute you think hegel starts from so gila share one time in her article 
on Tarski and Semantics and the Blackwell Companion to Philosophical Logic brought up uh, sort of the two different approaches uh, with uh, metalogic. Some, like Alfred Tarski, they take a bottom-up approach where they start with some object logic and then they'll have, they'll construct the metalogic um, on the basis of that object logic where it refers to formulas from that object logic. And then you could have a, a metalogic that refers to the formulas of the metalogic that's constructed on top of that. But he, she also points out that's like the bottom-up strategy, but the, she also points out there is also a sort of um, top-down strategy that you could approach where you have a single metalogic that then talks about other logics under it. So you, you would call it like a logical framework. It's basically a logic you use to talk about all other logics. Do you think Hegel, uh, since you've been reading quite a bit about Hegel, do you think Hegel's uh, doing a, a bottom-up approach like Tarski or a top-down approach maybe that, uh, that Cher is talking about? So like, let's make sure I understand these correctly before. <laughs> so in the sense that the, 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 the bottom-up approach is... Um, essentially that it is, uh, there is this, um, um, that there are these, uh, that you are reasoning your way up to, from, from, uh, essentially a fundamental logic, reasoning your way up to, uh, like how, how, like in the sense that like, so the top down approach is that there is a meta logic, which makes all other logics intelligible, right? And, and, and oh, that is used to interpret oh, all other logics and the bottom it's up a approach. One, it's a yeah, the, the top down is the meta logic. It has all the other it has all the other logical languages, the mm -hmm. formulas yeah. of them that it can give rep, uh, term representations to. Such that That's the top down they, approach, yeah, right. such that they 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 are um, essentially like we could even think of it as like um, they are made that their, their truth is contained within the truth of this uh, top the, the the highest possible top down approach. Such that, like each logical system, the truth of each of the axioms and the way of approaching logically uh, is contained within that top-down approach. Uh, you would have to have a you would have to have a definition, like a formal definition of a logic, in order to say the class of all logics, and then go about, uh, you know, list, uh, being able to uh, have listing out or have a rule of syntax that grants you uh, mm -hmm. the various. Um, term representations for all the different formulas over there. I'd, I'd say a more modest approach would would be more realistic. For now, you could say have you could have a logical framework of all known logics that have been so far specified. You see that that's a bit more doable. Yeah. Uh, Tar Tarski's approach, which was the bottom up approach, was where the object logic. And when I say object logic, I just mean like those toy logical theories that don't have a meta theoretic uh, logical language. Right. That's that's your basis, okay? And then you construct a meta logic referring to those formulas, would, and then a meta logic referring to those, and that's, right. that's the bottom up approach. I, yeah. I think that what Hegel would really be saying is that there is a from a top down approach, such that, um, and and even in terms of this modesty, such that we are uh, like in 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 terms of the more moderate approach or modest approach, which is to say that, so for example. The culmination of human thought at a specific time, or the culmination of thought at a specific point in history, would contain the uh, the logic of all the thoughts of all the of all the logics that pre-existed it, um, which was necessarily increasing in relation to the application, uh, which is discovering, as as you say, almost like proving new, more refined logical mechanisms in terms of the 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 can the uh, the or pr principles in in the continued application such that the next generation will have more again which will be contained within this top-down approach and then the generation after will have more again and the generation right. after will have more again and what so it, would become wants, part of a, it would become part of logical practice to keep expanding 100 percent, 100 unknown logics included in this logical framework but what hegel's going to want to say is that the there is a point in which is the end of history which unites the unity of logic such that this is necessarily all of the logics, the specific modes of thought and uh, uh, ways of, let's say, modes of deduction, which are possible. Um, and that would be... So at some point, yeah, so at some point we reach the formal definition of a logic by which we can then say, 
So this is the logical framework that yes. can have term representations for all possible formulae. Yes. Um, hmm. But that and that would be the end of history, in many ways. Or like, uh, but that's like it's not like a temporal end. It's it is it is a it's a formal end, a formal unity, such that it is um, it defines um like it defines the a, a unity in thought such that the the this is why hegel's going to say like essentially if you think of like this as the underlying if if the logic is actually like in its real sense is the underlying structure of reality and that is thought or thinking then it would be the unity of that structure with the contents of itself such that it knew itself as that structure um and, oh, and like a mirror in a way yeah necessarily like a uh, necessarily like a mirror and he's going to say that's god that and he's going to say that, that 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 that's what that's what god is essentially a perfect self relation and that's why it's going to be trinitarian because it's going to be uh, a relation between like the father as essentially the existence of that structure the son which is the essence of that structure like the the uh the 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 sort of mirrored reality of that structure and then the spirit which is the unity of the two um as this constant thinking um and that's why it's aspiration do you know where i could learn more about uh hegel's view about trinitarianism i'd like to read more about that um specifically in the science of logic um that's where it really like it sort of forms the basis of this but like I mean, I, I should probably write something on it myself um, because I don't. I think it's underexplored in some respects. Um, I could try and hunt out some papers and see if I could send you them over. Yes, please. I would very much appreciate that. Yeah, I hundred percent do that, man. Um, but uh, you're gonna have to send me some some reading on logic, man. You're gonna have to. I'll have to. I'll have to do it. Like I know I've got to do it. Like you know, I've got to like get a. Yes, a, a, I can do that for you. Yeah. Okay. We'll trade. We'll trade. Yes. Yes, if you just let me know um, where you're, uh, and it doesn't matter if it's formal education or informal education. Just, just tell me um, how far you've gotten, and I can, I can help you out from there. Yeah, I mean to be fair, like I think, like my relationship to logic, I think is is like even like like what I what I what I feel like I know, and like well what I what. I, like even in terms of like what I've well, tried, to you learn, don't have to tell me. You don't no, have to no, tell me. No, no, here. I mean, I was, no, no. I was just gonna say like even like I, I I'm okay. not really I'm embarrassed about it because like in general like mm -hmm. like you know like you shouldn't be embarrassed about what you don't know, right? Like it, it's something sure. that yeah. As Socrates tells us, you know, it's it's there's nothing shameful. In, and in I certainly know that I am not wise when it comes to the study <laughs> of logic. Like there's a reason like why I don't really make content about logic in general. Like I I. I and it's like I'm very well aware that I need to do more work in it, right? In terms of like how I approach logic, um, and like my engagement, so um, like well, I have a friend. He's like, he's like, you know, we were discussing prop logic, and he's like, he's like, you know, he was studying logic because he's doing analytic philosophy. He's like, I will teach you what I'm learning in logic, and I was talking to him with uh, for a while about it, and you know, a lot of the stuff is sort of intuitive and, um. I feel like is sort of taught in continental philosophy in a kind of roundabout way. Um, okay. But it's not really taught in the, in the same sort of direct explicated and even like well thought out way. Uh, and I think that there's an advantage of even classical philosophy, like scholastic classical philosophy and, um, and the way that classical philosophy was taught rather. And um, even indeed, and uh and analytic philosophy and i think analytic philosophy did actually manage to continue that and i think it is probably one of the biggest weaknesses of uh continental philosophy if you can think of like one of the weaknesses of like analytic philosophy in terms of like how they've approached it as almost a severance with the with some aspects of the philosophy of history um i think yes, this, I is, this, is, this is the same sort of thing i think in 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 a lot of continental philosophy such that I don't see many continental departments engaging in a kind of formal study of logic. Uh, bar Hegel, because Hegel kind of does, but like 
Hegel's is very much like ontologically rich and he's not going into specific different competing conceptions of logic itself, right? Right. All right, that's, that gives me an idea of, of where things are at. And so I can definitely send you resources. Um, and I think you would um, appreciate yeah, uh, absolutely. Put together. So, uh, like, just to answer that in a very brief way, I've read Aristotle. Like, I've it's been a long time since I've read Aristotle's post uh, prior analytics, and any sort of consideration of prop logic, and I uh, know bits about modal logic, not like massive amounts about modal logic, um, uh, and and yeah, like my my knowledge of logic, like specific forms of logical schools is very very limited so just send us send us what you can and i'll 100 percent engage and thank you very much thank you and uh is there anything else you would like to ask before I, before i bounce or yeah you... i think this is a good place to stop perfect perfect well thank you very much for coming on for the chat man it's very pleasurable and uh mm -hmm. i feel like uh Same. i feel like i definitely want to look into look into that more all right well, wonderful have a, have a good night man you too. Aristotle's great, Aaron. Come on, man. Don't don't be don't hate on Aristotle. You can't like the guy forms like so much of uh, what we do like in philosophy. Like even if you think oh, Aristotle's not right, like you gotta you gotta give Aristotle the time of day. You gotta give him his credit. Right. Oh, I love Aristotle. I do love Aristotle. What a man. Okay. Nah, I actually. I... Okay, guys. I hope he's had a very fun stream. I hope he's enjoyed this. I'm gonna have to change the title of this stream. I'm not sure what I'm gonna call it. Any any suggestions? Like debating gay sex again that would be like the majority of it like it just seems like debating the mora the morality of gay sex again and I, I don't um not even sure how to what what to call it Okay. Okay, right. I hope you've enjoyed this stream, guys. I really liked that, uh, and I really appreciate the people who called in, CEP, Mario, and uh, sorry, Maximo, that I didn't get to talk to you. Um, it was fun watching the classical uh, theists' arguments, although I do disagree with them, and I'm still convinced that you can be homosexual and a good person. Um, or you can commit homosexual acts and be doing a good thing. Um, and yeah, like, um, natural law, sexual ethics, and logic. Yeah, that's a good, there, there it is. That's solid. There we go. The logician at work, right, man? Natural law, sexual ethics, and logic. That's it. Natural law, sexual ethics, and logic. That's a good title. I like it. I like it. Right. If you like the stream, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing, and if you're interested in learning philosophy, such as natural law, um, such as Hegelian metaphysics and ethics, which was being discussed today, then check out my course, An Introduction to Western Philosophy. You'll find the link in the description. As always, everyone, try to gain some perspective, and have a good night.